process for the biennial budget. We're looking forward to three weeks of this process. We got a little uh, sidetracked yesterday afternoon. We were going to start, but the snow day hindered us. So if you were scheduled for yesterday afternoon, Tuesday, that's now happening uh, this Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So welcome again. Uh, I'd like to have all of the AFA members that are on uh, line right now raise their hands and I'll uh, call on you to begin introductions. Wonderful. Representative Fay. Good morning, I'm Representative Jessica Fay. I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Poland, and Raymond. Thank you. Representative Cloutier. Good morning, I am Kristen Cloutier. I represent House District 60, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Corey. Good morning, I'm Patrick Corey. I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Uh, Representative Cardone. Good morning, I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127, which is part of Bangor. Representative Hymanson. Hi, I'm Patty Hymanson. Pleasure to see Health and Human Services here today. I represent House District 4, which is parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Ogunquit. Representative Arata. Hello, my name is Amy Arada, and I represent District 65, which includes New Gloucester and part of Poland. Thank you. And I think Representative Millett. Good morning, everyone. I'm Soen Millett. I represent House District 71, which includes the citizens of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. Thank you. And uh, Chair Breen. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I appreciate you starting us off. My name is Kathy Breen. I represent six and a half communities in Cumberland County and I serve as Senate Chair of Appropriations. And then we have uh, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Donna Bailey. I represent Senate District 31, Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Bloomington, and part of Buxton. I'm not seeing any other AFA members. Unless, is Senator Davis here? Yeah. Madam Chair, Senator Davis has a bill to present at 10. He'll join us shortly. Fair enough. So seeing no one else that's from uh, AFA that we haven't introduced, I'll ask that the HHS committee members who've joined us today for the public hearing raise their hands. And if you, uh, and we'll, uh, maybe I'll turn to Senator Claxton to help introduce his group. Good morning. We'll go around the virtual horseshoe and have people introduce themselves, starting with Representative Zager. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sam Zager, represent District 41 in Portland. I uh, really appreciate AFA having us. Representative Lemelin. Good morning. I'm Michael Lemelin. I represent District 88. It's Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield, and half of Nobleboro. Uh, Representative Perry. Good morning, I'm Representative Ann Perry. I represent House District 140, which includes Indian Township, Baileyville, Baring, Callis, Charlotte, Robinston, Perry, Pembroke, and Pleasant Point. Representative Griffin. Good morning, my name is Abigail Griffin. I represent House District 102, which is Glumber, Levant, and Kadeske. Representative Connor. Good morning, AFA and HHS. My name is John Connor, and I represent House District 58, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Craven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you for having us. My name is Margaret Craven, and I represent House District 59, which is part of Lewiston. Uh, let's see. Representative Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. I'm Representative Michelle Meyer serving Southern Maine's House District 2, which is Elliott and parts of Kittery and South Berwick. And I'm Ned Claxton. I represent Senate District 20, which are the folks in Auburn, Mine and Mechanic Falls, Poland, and New Gloucester. Several of our members are presenting in other committees and will join us as they can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Appreciate you doing that. Um, again, I'm Representative Teresa Purse. I'm the House Chair of AFA. I represent House District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth. I'm delighted to be here today, but I also have a bill that has a work session at 10 a.m. 
So I will be turning this over to my good co-chair while I go off to do that. I'll see you uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, but uh, look forward to hearing the testimony and reading what I've missed. So thanks. Thank you very much, Representative Peirce. Really appreciate that. And uh, let me welcome uh, all of our friends from Health and Human Services. Um, I uh, just want to remind you in the event that um, Representative Peirce uh, didn't that we are live on YouTube and on Zoom. And so um, I'm going to ask that everybody keep themselves on mute unless they specifically have a question. It looks like Senator Claxton does. Senator Claxton. I goofed and ignored Representative Stover. I didn't see her here, so she should have a chance to say hi. Oh, please, Representative Stover. Good morning and thank you. Uh, my name is Holly Stover. I represent, represent House District 89, including Booth Bay, Booth Bay Harbor, Southport, Edgecombe, Westport Island, and part of South Bristol. Thank you. Wonderful, welcome. Um, so today is the beginning, uh, a little bit delayed because of yesterday's uh, winter weather. Uh, we are at the very top of our joint hearings on the governor's proposed biennial budget. And um, as these two committees know, Health and Human Services uh, form a very significant portion of how we um, spend uh, state resources, invest state resources. So um, we are going to be hearing first uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as um, I imagine the DAS commissioner um, to present. And um, we will primarily be in a listening mode. Um, we will be taking some public testimony when we have finished today. Unfortunately, we don't have the uh, fluency or the flexibility with Zoom to have public comments come in by section. So we're gonna have to sort of tick through each section um, but if there is an in, in the natural break of the schedule uh, today, I will stop and ask questions um, from the committee so that the committee can ask questions uh, as we move through different sections. So um, today you'll see actually they are non DHHS departments and agencies. So I misspoke, it's, it's not actually the department, but it's health and human services related entities in state government that will, uh, or who work with state government that will be presenting today. And that will start shortly. Um, we will end when we finish with that with some uh, public testimony. And then we will reconvene at one o'clock to start our afternoon session. And that at that time, we will hear from hospitals, physicians, pharmacies, and transportation providers. So again, I just wanna ask everybody to make sure that you're um, at mute and um, I will take the liberty of muting you if I see that you're not on mute just because um, I don't want anybody to be broadcasting things they don't mean to broadcast. So before we get going, are there any questions from any committee members, AFA or HHS? I'm not seeing any. If something comes up in the middle of things, um, please use your raise hand function and I will stop and, um, and acknowledge you if you're having a technical issue or you know something like that. If the raise hand thing is not working, you can also just turn off your mute and yell Madam Chair and we'll stop and, and take care of things. Um, so I think, um, that's all for now. And I will um, welcome, uh, I see in her Hollywood Square, Commissioner Figueroa. Welcome, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. All right, well, I will get started. Um, just gonna click into my screen here. Good morning, Senator Breen. Representative Purse and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Kirsten Figueroa, and I am the Commissioner of the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. I am here today 
to testify in support of the fiscal year 22-23 biennial budget bill, LD-221, specifically those items on today's agenda relating to the Department of Administrative and Financial Services and to the Executive Department. As Governor Mills has said, at a time when Maine people are hurting, when small businesses are struggling to keep their doors open, when the ranks of the unemployed have swelled, and when we are fighting a deadly virus all around us, we are proposing balanced budgets as required by the Constitution that continue efficiencies, good fiscal management, and curtailments to cover projected revenue shortfalls for all three fiscal years. They focus on combating the COVID-19 pandemic, by continuing to rebuild the state's public health infrastructure and protecting essential healthcare, education, and life-saving services. They do not change main tax rates and they maintain the budget stabilization fund. With a future made unpredictable due to the ongoing pandemic, these budgets make good on the promise of government, which is to protect and support the well-being of our people and institutions. Under the Department of Administrative and Financial Services, the Maine Developmental Disabilities Council, MDDC, which can be found on page A24 of the budget document, contains a general fund appropriation of $160,155 each year and a federal expenditures fund allocation of $480,465 each year. The council is a public instrumentality of the state and under the Federal Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act of 2000, MDDC is required to ensure that individuals with developmental disabilities and their families participate in the design of and have access to needed community services, individualized supports, and other forms of assistance that promote self-determination, independence, productivity, integration, and inclusion in all facets of family and community life. There are no new initiatives in this program. In the executive department, the Ombudsman Program can be found on page A202 of the budget document. The program is an independent program within the executive department to assist people with resolving concerns and complaints regarding child welfare services provided by the Department of Health and Human Services. There is a $201,539 appropriation in each fiscal year and a federal expenditures allocation of $57,150 in each year. There are no new initiatives in this program. And this concludes my testimony. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Um, are there any questions? Um, so let, Commissioner, one second. Did you do the Hospice Council and the Early Childhood Advisory Council? Did you go over those? No, I did not. Okay. Were you planning to do those? This section confused me a little bit. I have, I have DAFs and I have executive department and assumed that the others would be here. Maureen, I'm okay. sorry. Yes, is that right? Okay. Hi, Maureen. Yeah. Yes, I believe there are uh, people from some of those other uh, entities that are here. Okay. Uh, to talk. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so before we move on then to those, um, maybe, well, no, let's move on to those and then um, we'll go back to the commissioner if we have questions about those sections. Um, so um, we have, I hope, uh, I believe hospice council, the main hospice council should be next. And I see uh, Representative Fecto has joined us for appropriations. Nice to see you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ms. Powell. Your audio is not terrific. A little oh echoey. Oh dear, can you, is this better? It's a little better, yeah. Go okay. ahead. 
Uh, my voice tends to be rather soft, so I'll try to speak as loud as I can. Oh, that's, oh, it's better already. Thank you. Uh, all right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Senator Breen, um, <clears throat> Representative Pierce, Senator Claxton, and Representative Meyer, uh, it's a privilege as always for me to be before you and talk about the wonderful work our organization has done for the last 30 plus years. So today I would just like to update you. You have a busy morning and I just would like to bring some attention to some of our programming that we have been working on uh, diligently over the past year. Uh, during this time of COVID and the pandemic that we've been faced with, we are one of many organizations that have struggled um, with sustainability, but I've got to tell you we have always been resourceful with all aspects of our organization. And I think in times like this, we see the value of being resourceful. And that is what really has sustained us over many, many, many years. Our overhead is low. We only have one FTE, full-time FTE and one part-time FTE to do all of our programming. I think before you, you have my report and some attachments that we sent along with it for those of you who may not know about our work. But I would just like to highlight uh, some of the ongoing programs that we are working on. I'm sure you'd be interested in all of them. And one of the things I would like to bring to your attention is that our grant work, which we have relied on heavily, especially lately, just because our traditional ways of raising money have been altered somewhat, as you have probably heard from, from many, many other people. The average life expectancy of a small nonprofit is six to 10 years. We have been in business for well over 30 years. And so I think we've done a good job of managing the funds that we have and stretching them as far as we can. Uh, one of the things that we take a great deal of pride in is outreach to underserved populations, which many foundations now are looking upon very, very favorably. We were doing it a long time ago as a key element of our mission, but I think it's raised to the level of attention from a lot more foundations. And this year, we have just been fortunate that the work we do has attracted the attention of a lot of, of foundations. And we, because we have had to rely heavily on grant writing this year, even though approximately 60% of our budget is, is, uh, has relied on grant writing over the years, but um, this year especially, and we've been very fortunate because the work we do, the grants we write, have always and will continue to build on one another, um, which it is, makes sense. And it started way back when I came to this position back in the early 90s. And it just was a very reasonable way to build uh, this organization and for grants to build on one another. So right now, um, um, I'm sure you'll be reading the report, but I would like to highlight a grant that we're working on right now, which is um, we were invited by the National Post Organization in Oregon to um, partner with them uh, to receive a very generous grant from the Hillman Foundation to provide greater access to post utilization, advanced care planning, um, goals of care conversations in our highly rural areas of Maine. And that's very exciting. We've been working with the Jackman area to increase uh, rural access in that region, but this gives them a whole dimension of excitement to work on. Believe it or not, they only have one nurse in that community, but that community is so resourceful. So that's a very generous grant. It is about $90,000 for us at a time when we certainly, certainly are grateful for that amount of money coming in to our office. So I wanted to highlight that with you. 
I also want to talk about another rural grant that we're working on, on behalf of the Palliative Care and Quality of Life Advisory Council. It's called a surge grant, it's an innovation grant, and uh, we'll be working with the uh, Maine Health Access Foundation on that one. And hopefully we'll be lucky enough to have our proposal accepted, but our letter of intent was accepted. So uh, we've been invited to complete a full proposal. So those are two very ambitious grants that we'll be working on right now on behalf of some of the programming that we do. And again, you know, we are very frugal with our, our overhead and um, continue to manage all of this grant work with just um, one and a half FTEs. So I, we're proud of that. I hope you folks are proud of that too. And I, I will say one more thing before I end my remarks that we couldn't do what we do if we had not had a diverse revenue source over all these years. Again, that is how we've sustained our work. And also I'd like to give a shout out to the multidisciplinary board we have. Our board members are so supportive of our work and even to the point where some of our grant work has been adopted by uh, other countries and I have been working as a, um, a visiting professor with Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, Scotland um, on behalf of one of our programs. So all that said, I will end my remarks and um, be glad to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Um, <clears throat> uh, Representative Millett, if you don't mind, I just wanna get through the next section and then we'll open it up to various folks. Thank you so much. So now um, from the main children's cabinet, early childhood advisory council. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Well, but please well. stay tuned to get take some questions, okay? Sir. Thank you so much. Um, Maureen, do we have uh, somebody from the Maine Children's Cabinet Early Childhood Advisory Council? Or should I ask that question of Mandy? Uh, I am not sure. I get that one mixed up with the other children's one. Um, Charlie Sultan sent testimony. I believe it was for that, and I'm not sure he's here. Okay, let me just look and make sure that um, yeah. I don't see anybody. We have uh, Ms. Cronin from MDDC, I know is here, and the disability rights, Mr. Riley is here, but okay. I'm not sure about that. Um, and um, could, could the gentleman from Disability Rights come on for a moment? Hey, hi, Mr. Hello. Riley. Hello, um, good morning. Good morning. Were you planning to present this morning? Uh, if you'll have me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I I'm glad. I just don't wanna catch people off guard. Um, um, all right, so let's um, hear from Disability Rights um, and their presentation. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Senators Breen uh, and Claxton and uh, Representatives Person Meyer and members of both committees. Uh, my name's Atlee Riley. I'm an attorney at Disability Rights Maine, which is Maine's protection and advocacy agency for people with disabilities. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just, you did catch me slightly off guard. So I'm just pulling up my testimony so I can refer to it. Um, I did submit uh, some testimony. Um, no problem, take your time. That, let's see. There we go. Um, uh, you should have uh, a three-page letter and then also four pages attached to that. Uh, that's some case summaries um, of just work that we've done over the past two years. I'm not going to read um, any of the summaries to you and I'm not going to read the entire letter, um, but I do want to highlight just a few things um, uh, going through it. Um, this appropriation um, uh, of $126,045 is generally consistent um, with funding that um, has been appropriated to Disability Rights Maine to support ed educational ad advocacy um, since 2007. Um, and uh, we're very grateful um, for that. I just wanna highlight some of the things that it allows us to do. Um, many of you know Disability Rights Maine in other contexts, um, and we have over 40 staff, uh, 14 of whom are attorneys. We work um, under 21 different 
um, funding sources across 15 uh, federal and state programs um, to ensure that Mainers with disabilities are protected from abuse, are able to control decisions that affect their lives, uh, receive services and supports necessary to live independently, and have the opportunity to work and contribute, as well as equal access to the same opportunities afforded other Mainers. Um, specifically, what I want to talk to you about today um, is the work that we do in education. Uh, we have two attorneys uh, that provide educational advocacy services statewide. Um, there are no federal funds um, earmarked for educational advocacy. There's not a, a federal appropriation for protection and advocacy work uh, focused on education. Hopefully in the future there will be, but there's not currently. Um, because of that, um, for a number of years, uh, the state of Maine has in recognition of the importance of this type of advocacy uh, supplemented our federal funding. Um, this allows us to provide free legal services um, and support to students with disabilities and their families. Um, we represent students in the kind of following priority, priority areas, um, students who are being placed in unnecessarily restrictive settings, um, students who are excluded from school for behaviors that may be related to their disabilities, um, uh, students who are victims of abuse and neglect in schools, which often those types of cases are overuse and abuse of seclusion and restraint. Um, looking at um, students who are not receiving education uh, that's, that's appropriate to prepare them for transition to post-secondary activities, including employment. Those are the main areas that we work in. Um, in FY uh, 2019, uh, these uh, two attorneys, myself and a colleague, Ben Jones, um, handled 239 uh, individual cases, um, as well as 174 cases in FY 2020. Um, uh, the pandemic, which I'll, I'll talk about, caused um, intake to kind of uh, drop in March a little bit as far as uh, folks, but the demand is definitely uh, for services is, is, um, is, has returned uh, certainly to normal and in, is increasing. Um, we uh, also do a lot of non-case um, related work. We serve uh, you know, on different um, interest groups and commissions and um, work groups. Uh, we also do a lot of training, uh, training for case managers, uh, training for DHHS um, staff and um, case, case workers, um, also for parents. Um, and uh, we had some exciting work uh, with a lot of different partners over the last couple of years. Um, helping to stand up a pro bono panel that will provide free legal services to students who are facing exclusions from school. So um, uh, kind of getting the private bar trained and supported to provide um, some necessary uh, free legal services. So a wide range of work, um, as you might imagine, uh, since March 2020, uh, we've been very much focused on supporting families navigating the um, very significant um, pandemic related educational disruptions. Um, for some students with disabilities, remote learning is just not a viable option. Um, other students um, really need significant support to access it. And the supports, as many of you know, um, both at home, um, in the community, and at schools have been, have been difficult to come by. Um, so um, we've seen a lot of good things. We've seen some schools going to really great lengths, trying to individualize responses, um, and other schools um, saying, you know, being fairly rigid and, and things just aren't working, certainly for some students with disabilities. Um, the law hasn't changed either. <laughs> and so we've been doing these trainings and in this uh, context where the world has changed and the law has not. And um, there's certainly a thirst out there for information. Um, we had um, the one silver lining, certainly in this pandemic, and maybe you guys are, are, are um, noticing others uh, in, in uh, the way that we're now able to reach people, is we had a training um, for parents um, in collaboration with Maine Parent Federation that has been, was viewed live by over a thousand people and then quickly um, thousands more um, uh, viewed it. And so that's the kind of reach we would have never uh, gotten before. I couldn't imagine training a thousand people at once <laughs> um, before this. So um, um, that's kind of where we shifted. And now um, we're shifting to trying to um, help students and families um, get reconnected and connected to school and try to address some of the learning losses um, that have occurred. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. It seems like the plan is to, to have folks wait and I, um, I can certainly stick around uh, as long as everybody else is, um, is presenting and answer your questions then. Um, but just wanna uh, say that this uh, funding is extremely important um, to the educational advocacy work that we do and um, we uh, remain appreciative of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riley. 
And we would ask that you stick around. Um, we're going to do one more. We're going to hear from one more party, and then we will open it up to um, the committee for questions, and then take some public testimony. So I believe Nancy Cronin is here to present from the Maine Developmental Disabilities Council. Good morning, Ms. Cronin. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, and thank you very much for taking the time to, to letting it, me tell you a little bit about the Maine Developmental Disabilities Council. So I, I am also not going to read my entire testimony. I have sent it to you. Um, and, uh, and, and we've also had the opportunity to, to introduce ourselves to the Maine Health and Human Services Committee. So I'm just gonna give you an, a little bit about Maine Developmental Disability and a little bit of the highlights of what, what we do. Uh, so we are a federally funded organization that requires a state match. And that is what I am testifying for, for support for. We have been around for about 50 years now. We are funded primarily through the Developmental Disabilities Act and Bill, Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. There's a council in every state and territory in the nation. And our role is to ensure that people with developmental disabilities and their family has input in all the rules and, and all of the um, laws that affect them. So we do that in a number of ways. We promote systems change through providing seed money for, for potential grants. So for instance, one thing that we're doing is we have provided funding to a, um, a provider that has a special purpose program as well as a residential program to do a uh, fidelity program through Cornell to see whether or not they could reduce restraint and seclusion. So if it works, then we will be able to share with, uh, uh, with, we will be able to share a program that actually reduces restraint and seclusion with the state so that they can assist and be able to um, hopefully spread it across the state. We provide seed money so that we can test things out before we ended up putting large amounts of federal, uh, state tax money and federal money without knowing it. We do um, advocacy for, for systems change in the same way. Um, a couple things that we, we did this, this year that I wanna highlight to you is we're really very interested in healthcare and health disparities of people with developmental disabilities. It's very clear to us that the data shows that people with developmental disabilities report having poorer health, shorter average life expectancy than the general population, less likely to receive preventative care, higher rates of, of, of um, hearing and vision impairments, and, and basically higher rates of poorly managed chronic care conditions. So for the last 20 years, we have been approaching this issue by going to doctors and, and, and teaching them about developmental disabilities. We've decided that that's just a terrible idea. It makes a whole lot more sense to go to doctors and when they're learning about chronic care conditions, which will affect a large percentage of their, of their population of people they care for, include people with DD. So when they're learning about diabetes, include people with developmental disabilities as, a, as an example, so that you're infusing people with developmental disabilities into the existing preparatory that doctors are doing. Makes a lot more sense. And we're working with Maine Primary Care Association and the federally qualified health um, health uh, hospitals in this state to do just that. And we're really proud of it. We're doing it through Project ECHO. We're about to present um, nationally about some of the work. We're the first state to kind of look at things differently and turn things on its head, as opposed to telling doctors or medical professionals about people with DD. We're talking about how to include people with DD when they're learning about other things, uh, other chronic care conditions that affect people with DD as well as everybody else. Another thing that I'm super proud of is when COVID happened, uh, it was very clear to us that some of the work around in-person training wasn't going to be able to happen. So we were very rapidly able to take our money and shift it and in, a, in, in April to, to say, how do we ensure that people with developmental disabilities are able to adapt the same way everybody else is, specifically through Zoom? Everybody else really shifted on its head and started Zooming and meeting with families and doing telehealth. 
Well, we've known for a long time that people with DD don't have the same access to technology as everybody else. So we immediately bought 147 new iPads. And in a week time, we created an application to be able to get that, to be able to, to find people who had Wi-Fi, who wanted to learn, who wanted it. We worked with the, the University of Maine at Orono to make sure that that individuals with developmental disabilities had technical support. Um, we sent one email out saying that we were doing this, just one. In three days, we had 450 requests for iPads for, from, from people who were three-year-olds or families of children with three-year-olds saying we need access and we're having trouble getting early intervention to 70-year-olds saying I live in a group home and I wanna be able to see my family and this is impossible. It was very clear to us that the need for technology and the gap in access to technology is very strong for people with developmental disabilities. And as we are all now, um, well, accessing community in very different ways, it's very important to the DD Council that we support people with developmental disabilities to be able to, to engage in the same way as I am with you at this very moment. I, uh, the 147 iPads that we were able to, to, to give, um, helped tremendously. We've done a number of, of uh, six month um, check-ins, how, how are people doing and lives literally changed. But the fact that 450 requests came in within days and they were, it really speaks to what the work has to be done in the future. And as we write our next five year state plan, that's going to be it. The federal government wants um, states to have a minority focus for at least one goal objective. And that was a toughie for Maine. It's like, well, what should ours be? Should it be refugees? Yes, that's wonderful. There's, there's about 5,000 people and that is important. Should it be poverty? Well, that's all over the place. It's almost not a minority. We chose technology because that is really where our access is, is, is making the difference between being able to work and be employed and access healthcare and access your education. So that's gonna be one of the things that we do coming up. Um, we are also looking at uh, new waiver models that might be more efficient, um, cost less and be more valuable. So we're looking at the self-directed delivery model, which is an alternative to the traditionally agency delivery model, which is what Maine has. Maine is only one of a handful of states that do not have an option for self-directed care. What this would be is individuals with developmental disability or their families would be able to say, you know, I need this much money and I just need a couple hours and I know the person down the street and they will be able to help me and that will allow me to get to work or whatever they might need, as opposed to this package of very expensive services that may not actually fit the need. It may be too much, it may be too little, but provide families an opportunity to get their individual what they need when they need it. We're looking for the right kind of service, the right amount of service and the right cost, because as you also know, Maine spends quite a bit of money on these services. And that's important. Well, no, what's important is kids, people get the services that they need. Ideally, we can do it without breaking the bank all the time. All right. And lastly, the last thing that I think I'm going to highlight is we ensure self-advocates have voice. So we are the one of the primary funding funders for speaking up for us which is a group of adults with developmental disabilities across the state um, in which they are, they speak to us regularly about their lives and we support them speaking their truths to you as well as other policy members. That's a little bit of what we do. How many people do we, we hire? Well, with our, with our money and you give us 25%, that's that 160,000. So we get all of maybe 650,000, 700,000 a year. What we end up doing is we're supporting two full-time staff and one part-time staff, and that's it. The rest of the money all goes to actually seeding um, innovative ideas and supporting people in the community. It's really important work. I love our job. 
my job. It's the best in the state. Um, and it's, and I'm asking for the match and I will stick around for questions. I have lots I could say, but you guys are really busy. So I'll stop now. Thank you very much, Ms. Cronin. I appreciate it. Um, so I don't think we have anybody here from the Maine Children's Cabinet Early Childhood Advisory Council, unless I'm wrong. If there is somebody here, would you mind raising your electronic hand? That would be very helpful. Okay, I don't see anybody. Um, so what I would like to do is um, take questions um, from the committees to the various parties who presented. And um, I have written down the names of the folks who presented. So um, if you're not sure exactly who the indi individual is, feel free to just use the organization name. Um, and then I will call on that person. I don't, however, we don't have um, Mr. Sultan here for the main children's trust. So um, we do have folks from Maine Disability, Developmental Disabilities Council, Disability Rights. We have the um, DAS commissioner here for the ombudsman program. And we have uh, someone here from the hospice council. So um, I see Representative Craven and um, our Representative Millett will be next. So Representative Craven. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, I am, uh, I serve on the Hospice Council of Maine, and uh, I know this is not a work session, but since that we're in appropriations, I just want to uh, add my admiration um, to uh, Candace's uh, presentation and how, uh, how they maximize any funding that they get with grant writing. And uh, we can't even buy the compassion and generosity and the support for hospice and palliative care and services to um, veterans that they provide. And I just uh, want to add my, um, my wholehearted um, support for the program and, and for the work that they do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Millett, do you, uh, you have a question? Not a question, but I would also like to recognize and thank Candace Powell for her nearly 30 years of representing the Hospice Council before appropriations and health and human services. She's been a regular participant in room 228 um, throughout almost all of that period of time. I've watched her defend the program and become creative when budgetary pressures forced level funding or even minor cuts with her grant writing and her other skills and her responsiveness. And she's been a real um, real asset to the state. And I just wanna thank her and make her, um, all of the committee members aware of the fact that she is a long serving, very generous person who has gone above and beyond. Um, last summer, my family became dependent on hospice care for a key member. And and I was impressed with the compassion, the responsiveness and the generosity of those who came to serve. And I think a lot of that is due to Candace's leadership and commitment. So I just wanted to thank her publicly for all she's done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Millett. Um, it looks like Senator Claxton has his hand up. If anybody else has a question, I would ask that you raise your electronic hand. That will help me keep a cue. Um, thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Claxton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to recognize that Representatives Colleen Mad Madigan and Kathy Javner have joined us, as has Senator Moore. Terrific, thank you. And for members of the public, um, there is one way that this is similar to what we do in the building in that committee members often have commitments outside of their committees. And so folks are coming and going with their own bills and, and that sort of thing. Um, but rest assured all the testimony we receive uh, in today and anytime we uh, are very, very careful about reviewing. Um, Senator Moore, was there something that you were hoping to add or ask or um, no? 
Oh, okay. I'm just glad to be joining you all in person. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to see you too. Um, so I'm not seeing any other uh, hands up to uh, inquire anything about the folks that we have here today. Um, you've heard a lot of uh, really important programs that serve um, some of our most vulnerable communities. So on behalf of both committees, I wanna thank everybody for coming today and for all the really, really vital work you do for our communities all over the state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Maureen, would you mind coming on please? Our trusty analyst, thank you very much. Um, it looks to me like we have finished with our morning session, and, but we have the public for, for now, correct? No, yes, you're finished with your uh, presenters from yep. departments and agencies. I do not have the list, so I do not know who, or if anybody has signed up from the public. But. Okay, let me check here. Uh, I don't see any, but let me just check in with our clerk. Could our uh, clerk come on for a moment, please? Good morning, Mandy. Good morning. Um, I don't see anybody in line for public testimony. Do I have that accurate? Yes, we do not have any. Okay. So we might have some uh, later this afternoon, but it seems to me, and I'm just checking with our analysts that we have finished with this morning's uh, business and that we will reconvene at one o'clock. Is that correct? That is correct as far as I can see. Okay. And should we sign off and rejoin at one? I will leave that to the technical expert, Mandy. Yes, that would probably be best. I'm going to okay. put a message on that we are on break until one. Okay. All right. Any questions from any committee members before we uh, adjourn for the morning? Um, and any housekeeping questions, anything? Okay. Um, well, we will uh, see you all back here at one o'clock. Thank you.
interesting. Work of resources, which are often purpose restricted, and it's a constant struggle with.
Good afternoon, folks. I think it's about one o'clock. Nice to see you. Um, we are on live and we are reconvening with um, the Appropriations Committee of the Maine Legislature, as well as the Health and Human Services Committee. And um, we are on day one of our um, 
public hearings for the biennial budget proposal. And I just wanna give you a little bit of an update because of yesterday's snow day. I think committee, committee members might know, but for the sake of the public, yesterday's afternoon session was uh, canceled because of the weather. And um, we're gonna move that to tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So um, other than that, um, I wanna check in with my co-chair or with, um, either of the chairs from HHS to see if there's anything else I'm missing before we restart. Representative Purse? Uh, I'm all set. I think you covered everything. Looking forward to the afternoon. Senator Claxton? Thank you for the opportunity, but I think we're all good. I, I, I did tell you that the people had joined, so. Wonderful. Um, okay, so, um, I have my schedule in front of us and it looks like the first block we're gonna be hearing um, from Health and Human Services um, with respect to hospitals, physicians, pharmacy and transportation providers. And then after that, we'll have elder services and duly eligible members, um, folks who work in that arena. So um, looking for uh, there is Mr. Mann. Are, Mr. Mann, hello there. Are you representing the department today? Um, I see Mr. Wiley as well. Uh, who would like to kick us off? Uh, I'll be doing most of the talking. I'm joined by uh, Jeff Wiley, the budget director, and Molly Bogart, the uh, director of government affairs. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Uh, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Benjamin Mann, the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, DHHS. I'm here today to speak to, in support of LD221, the Governor's Biennial Budget Proposal for State Fiscal Years 22 and uh, 2023. As Governor Mills said, at a time when Maine people are hurting, when small businesses are struggling to keep their doors open, when the ranks of the unemployed have swelled, and when we are fighting a deadly virus all around us, we are proposing balanced budgets as required by the Constitution that continue efficiencies, good fiscal management, and curtailments to cover projected revenue shortfalls for all three fiscal years. They focus on combating the COVID-19 pandemic by continuing to rebuild the state's public health infrastructure and protecting essential health care education and life saving services. They do not change main tax rates and they maintain the budget stabilization fund. With a future made unpredictable due to the ongoing pandemic, these budgets make good on the promise of government, which is to protect and support the well-being of our people and our institutions. More specifically on the DHHS budget in particular, uh, Governor Mills's DHHS budget proposal for fiscal Fiscal year 22-23, Biennium continues policy efforts initiated at the outset of our administration, rebuilding critical parts of state government, such as services for Maine's most vulnerable residents and public health infrastructure, and strengthening health care to better serve and protect Maine families. Considering the acute and unprecedented demand on Maine's health and human services infrastructure, these investments continue to be timely, important, and responsible. Amid the difficult fiscal environment of the COVID-19 pandemic, biennial but this biennial budget balances targeted increases uh, in necessary spending while reducing expenditures through efficiencies and maximizing federal funding, all while avoiding layoffs and preserving vital services. Uh, and we'll uh, just dive into the initiatives now. Um, uh, so first we'll begin on page A246 with medical care payments to providers. This program funds Medicaid services administered by the Office of Maine Care Services. The first initiative on page 246 reduces funding for savings achieved by establishing a reimbursement methodology that reimburses 340B providers at the approximate cost of 340B a physician administered drugs. Mr. Mann. I apologize for interrupting, sorry. Are you sure it's 246, page 246, or is it page 264? I'm sorry, uh, 264. Okay, thank you so much. Of course. Um, 
264, excuse me. Um, this initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $2,061,775 in state fiscal year 2022 and $2,057,601 uh, $2 in state fiscal year 2023. Reduces allocation and federal expenditures fund all other by $4,862,171 in state fiscal year 2022 and $4,866,329 in state fiscal year 2023. and reduces allocation and federal block grant all other by $24,697 in state fiscal year 2022 and $24,713 in state fiscal year 2023. The next initiative also on uh, 264, uh, adjust funding between the general fund and other special revenue funds within the main care pharmacy program to reflect the drug rebates received annually. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $9,790,000 in state fiscal year 2022 and 2023 and increases allocation in other special revenue funds all other by the same amount in those same years. The next initiative on page uh, 265 reduces funding in medical care payments to providers uh, program by developing a preferred drug list and prior authorization process for physician administered drugs where there are biosimilar equivalents eligible for rebates. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $601,000 in state fiscal year 2022 and by $599,768 in state fiscal year 2023. And reduces allocation of the federal expenditures fund all other by one million three hundred ninety nine thousand dollars in state fiscal year twenty twenty two and one million four hundred thousand two hundred thirty two dollars in state fiscal year twenty three. The next initiative on page two hundred sixty six eliminates the pharmacy incentive payment to pharmacies serving main care members residing in rural areas, as the general dispensing fee was increased by over three hundred percent in late twenty eighteen. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $351,864 in state fiscal year 2022 and $365,618 in state fiscal year 2023 and reduces allocation and federal expenditures all other by $623,370 in 2022 and $624,150 in fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page 266 reduces main care prescription drug dispensing fee. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $1,728,009 in state fiscal year 22 and $1,724,178 in state fiscal year 23 and reduces allocation of federal expenditures fund all other by $3,061,000 in state fiscal year 2022 and $3,065,204 in state fiscal year 2023. Turning the page on the next, uh, the next initiative on page 267 reduces funding to align the rate structures with the and fee schedule for purchased durable medical equipment with those used by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $202,090 in state fiscal year 2022 by $201,654 in state fiscal year 2023. Reduces allocation and federal expenditures uh, fund all other by $388,262 in state fiscal year 22 and $388,690 in, uh, in fiscal year 23. Reduces allocation and federal block grant all other by $11,242 in state fiscal year 22 and $11,250 in state fiscal year 23. On that same page, the next initiative on the same page 267, adjust funding in medical care payments to providers program between general fund and other special revenue related to rebasing the hospital tax from fiscal year 2015, 2016 to 2017, 2018. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $11,818,376 in state fiscal year 2022 and 23, and increases allocation other special revenue funds all other by $11,818,376 in those same years. 
The next initiative on page A268, uh, adjust funding in order to claim enhanced expansion uh, federal Medica uh, medical ex assistance percentage, FMAP, uh, rates for weekly hospital prospective interim payments for treatment related to medic uh, Medicaid expansion population. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $13,450,874 in state fiscal year 2022 and $13,409,614 in state fiscal year 23 and increases allocation federal expenditures all other by $13,450,874 in state fiscal year 22 and $13,409,614 in state fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page 268 increases supplemental payments to hospitals. This initiative increases general fund all other by $3,184,713 in state fiscal years 22 and 23 and increases allocation um, in the federal expenditures fund all other by $8,103,172 in state fiscal years 22 and 23. The next initiative on page 268 reduces funding in medical care payments to providers program due to a one-time anticipated reduction in main care benefits manual chapter two, section 113, non-emergency transportation broker payments for fiscal years, uh, fiscal year 22. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $732,809 in state fiscal year 22 and reduces the allocation in the federal expenditures fund all other by $1 million $298,259 in that same fiscal year. The next initiative on page 269, adjust funding in order to claim enhanced expansion FMAP rates for biennial hospital supplemental payments. This initiative reduces general fund all other by, by funding, uh, general fund all other funding by $7,223,063 in state fiscal years 22 and 23 and increase the allocation and federal expenditures fund all other by 7,223,063 in state fiscal years 22 and 23. The next initiative on 270 provides funding for an increase in rates for federally qualified health centers as required by, the, uh, by CMS. This initiative provides general fund, all other funding of $293,571 in state fiscal years 22 and $299,140 in state fiscal year 23. It increases allocation and federal expenditures fund all other by $659,509 in state fiscal years 22 and $673,985 in state fiscal year 23. <clears throat> it increases allocation in the federal block grant all other by $30,892 in 22 and 31,000 $563 in 23. The final initiative in this section is on page 270 and it provides funding for an increase in rates for rural health centers as required by federal CMS. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of $73,544 in state fiscal year 22 and $74,869 in state fiscal year 23. Increases allocation in the federal expenditures fund all other by $156,663 in 22 and $159,968 in 23. And it finally increases allocation in federal block grant all other by $8,013 in 22 and $8,180 in state fiscal year 23. There's one language piece uh, tied to this section that language is uh, not in uh, part A, but in the language section on page 35L, part 00, this part updates the base year for the hospital tax, uh, the initiative that I referred to earlier. The next section is elderly services and duly eligible members. The next program on page 247 is the long-term long -term care office sorry, of aging. Sorry, Mr. Mann, I have a question coming from um, the Senate Chair of, of HHS, Senator Claxton. Hi, S some of us are newer to this process than others who've been here for several cycles. Yep. And so if, and I admire how well uh, 
Mr. Mann knows his his uh, his subject and, and topic, but if he could go a bit slower, that would make it easier for some of us to figure out the right page and the right initiative. Thank you. Certainly. Sorry about that. That. Thank you. Um, yep. Uh, next program on 247, the long-term care account, Office of Aging and Disability Services. This program pays for personal care, home health, and other needed services as an alternative to nursing home placement. Any remaining unallocated balances from the independent housing with services program will be transferred into this account. This program has one initiative. This initiative is on page, also on page 247 and reduces funding one time for mileage reimbursement by 15% due to a decrease, <coughs> excuse me, a decrease in travel during the COVID-19 pandemic and based on prior year expenditures. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $375 in state fiscal year 2022. 2023. The next program on page 248 is low cost drugs to main elderly. Uh, this program assists low income elderly in obtaining prescription drugs. This program has three initiatives. The first initiative is on page 248 and eliminates the pharmacy incentive payment to pharmacies serving main care members residing in rural areas as the general dispensing fee was increased by over 300% in late 2018. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $365,618 in state fiscal year 22 and 23. Also on the same page, uh, the next initiative reduces main care prescription drug dispensing fee. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $16,459 in state fiscal years 22, uh, 22 and 23. The next initiative on uh, page 248 increases funding in the medical care payment to providers program and decreases funding in the low cost drugs to main elderly program, the mental health services community Medicaid program and the office of substance abuse and mental health services Medicaid seed program to consolidate the four Medicaid assistance programs into one program as part of the consolidation of main care related programs from 13 to four. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by 4 million three hundred. $76,637 in 22 and 23. The next program on page 256, so we're skipping ahead uh, six pages or so, is the main prescription plus drug program. This program makes prescription drugs more affordable for qualified Maine residents, thereby increasing the overall health of Maine residents, promoting health, healthy communities and protecting the public health and welfare of Maine residents. This program has no initiatives. The next initiative is on page 264 is uh, uh, from the Medicare medical care payment to providers account. This program funds Medicaid services administered by the offices of main care services. Uh, there are four initiatives in this section. The first initiative is on page 265 and transfers funding for a revision uh, to main care benefits manual chapter two, section 19, which allows enhanced federal Medicaid assistance percentage for community uh, first choice option eligibility from the general fund to the federal expenditures fund within the same program. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $741,019 in state fiscal year 22 and uh, $1,482,038 in state fiscal year 23 and increases allocation in federal expenditures fund all other by $741,019 in state fiscal year 22 and $1,482,038 in state fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page uh, 267 provides funding to increase private non-medical institution services uh, rates by inflation per main care benefits manual chapter three, section 97, Appendix C, the principles of the re, of reimbursement for medical and remedial service facilities. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of $632,174 in state fiscal year 22 and $649,343 in state fiscal year 23. Increases allocation in federal expenditures fund all other by $1,519,005 in 22 and $1,566,848 in 23. 
increases allocation in the OSR funds, all other, by $225,237.22 and $232,900.22. In state fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page uh, 270 increases funding for the cost of living adjustments in adult family care homes. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of $89,884 in fiscal year 22 and $92,375 in state fiscal year 23, and increases allocation in federal expenditures fund all other by $159,240 in state fiscal year 22 and $164,223 in state fiscal year 23. The final initiative in this account is on page 270 and provides funding to modify main care estate recovery rules to, mandated federal, uh, to the man mandatory federal requirement. This initiative provides <clears throat> General fund all other funding of $416,870 in state fiscal year 22 and $415,946 in state fiscal year 23 and increases the allocation of the federal expenditures fund all other by $738,535 in 22 and $739,459 in, in fiscal year 23. Next program uh, is on page 281, and it's uh, the nursing facility account. This program provides funds for Medicaid payments to nursing facilities for the care of persons who are elderly, disabled, or with intellectual disabilities. This program also oversees funding for prescription drugs for those persons, as well as comprehensive dental care for individuals in intermediate care facilities and for individuals with intellectual disabilities. This program has seven initiatives. The first initiative on page 281 reduces funding by no longer allowing nursing facilities to claim reimbursement from main care for direct care costs for bed hold days since no direct care is actually provided. The initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $273,414 in state fiscal year 22 and $272,686 in state fiscal year 23 reduces allocation of federal expenditures fund all other by $581,003 in 22, and $581,731 in 23. And reduces allocation in OSR funds all other by $54,537 in uh, fiscal years 22 and 23. The next initiative on 281 adjusts funding as a result of the increase in the FMAP for federal fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $544,132 in state fiscal year 22, $906,887 in state fiscal year 23, and increases allocation of the federal expenditures fund all other by $544,132 in 22, and $906,888 in 23. $87 in 23. The third initiative in this section is on page 282 and provides funding and nursing facilities program for a cost of living increase in fiscal year 22, a cost of living increase and a rebasing in fiscal year 2023. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of $4,019,723 in 22 and $6,897,000. Uh, dollars twenty in twenty three increases allocation other uh, five hundred forty one thousand nine hundred eleven dollars in state fiscal year twenty twenty two and fourteen million seven hundred thirteen thousand six hundred forty four dollars in state fiscal year twenty twenty three and increases allocation in other special revenue all other by eight hundred one thousand eight hundred and six dollars in state fiscal year twenty two and $1,379,404 in state fiscal year 2023. The next initiative on page 282, uh, just funding in the de Medicaid dedicated tax account and the corresponding general fund accounts to bring baseline revenues in line with the December 2020 Revenue Forecasting Committee recommendations. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $988,368 in state fiscal year 22 and 23 and increases the OSR funds by the same amount in, uh, in 22 and 23. 
The next initiative on 282, uh, adjust funding to align with the existing resources. This initiative increases the allocation of the federal expenditures fund all other by $30 million in 22 and 23. The next initiative on page 282 increases funding in nursing facilities program and decreases funding in the private non-medical institutions room and board program to consolidate the two residential programs into one program as part of the consolidation of main care related to uh, related programs from 13 appropriations to four appropriations. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of 17,383,600 $189 in state fiscal year 22 and 23. The final initiative in the nursing facility account is on page 282 and increases funding in the nursing facility program and decreases funding in the residential treatment, uh, treatment facilities assessment program, the Medicaid uh, services development services program, the developmental services waiver supports to consolidate four programs into one program as part of the consolidation of main care related to re- main care related programs and accounts. This initiative increases the allocation in other special revenue funds by $2,027,000 in fiscal years 22 and 23. The next program is on page 287, is the Office of Aging and Disability Services Adult Protective Services. This program performs duties as required by um, that chapter, uh, Adult Protective Services Act. This program has three initiatives. The first initiative is on page 287, reduces funding in the Office of Aging and Disability Services, Adult Protective Services program due to the elimination of the bond requirement for a public guardian or public conservator under the main revised statutes, Title 18C, Section 5-710. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $14,000 in state fiscal year 22 and 23. The next initiative on page 287 reduces funding one time for employee mileage reimbursement by 15% due to a decrease in travel during COVID-19 pandemic and based on prior year expenditures. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $19,500 in 2022 and 23. The next initiative on page 287 reallocates one human services caseworker position from 100% general fund in the Office of Aging and Disability Services, Adult Protective Services program to 83% general fund in ODES APS program and 17% federal expenditures fund also uh, in the Office of Main Care Services program and adjusts all other. This initiative reduces general fund personnel services funding by $18,700 in state fiscal year 22 and $18,850 in state fiscal year 23. The general fund all other uh, and general fund all other by $1,049 in 22 and 23. The next program on page 289, skipping ahead one, is the Office of Aging and Disability Services Central Office. <clears throat> this program administers health and so- Uh, social services programs to assist elderly and disabled adults to remain independent in their communities. This program has four initiatives. The first initiative is on page 289, reduces funding one time for employee mileage reimbursement by 15% due to a decrease in travel during the COVID-19 pandemic and based on prior year expenditures. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $750 in 22 and 23. The next initiative also on 289 uh, provides funding for the approved reorganization of one office assistant two position to a social services program specialist one position. This initiative provides the general fund personal services uh, funding of $19,591 in state fiscal year 22, and it provides $20,248 in uh, state fiscal year uh, 2023. The next initiative on page 289 also establishes one social services uh, manager one position to serve as the nutrition services manager focusing on nutrition related programs under the Older Older Americans Act and one social services program specialist two position to serve as the aging services program specialist providing legal assistance developer services as required by the Older, Older Americans Act. It also provides funding for uh, related all other costs. This initiative increases allocation and federal expenditures fund 
personnel services by $193,665 in state fiscal year 22 and $202,847 in state fiscal year 23. And federal expenditures fund all other by $17,510 in state fiscal year 22, $17,728 in state fiscal year 2023. The final initiative in this section is on page uh, B2 and it provides funding for the approved reclassification of one uh, management analyst two position to a social services program specialist two position retroactive to May of 2016. This initiative increases allocation of federal expenditures fund personal services by $46,068 in 22 and $7,883 in state fiscal year 23 and federal expenditures fund all other of $1,060 in fiscal year 22 and $181 in state fiscal year 2023. The next program on page 304 is the PNMI room and board account. This program maintains a boarding home payment structure that reflects the needs of patients and reimburses homes based on the cost of efficient and economically run facilities. This program has three initiatives. The first initiative is on page 304 and provides funding to increase private non-medical institution services rates by uh, inflation per main care benefits manual, chapter three, section 97, appendix C, principles of reimbursement for medical and remedial services facilities. This initiative provides general fund all other funding of $1,377,531 in state fiscal year 22 and $1,418,609 in state fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page 304 increases funding in the nursing facilities program and decreases funding in the private non-medical institutions room and board program to consolidate two residential programs into one program as part of the consolidation of main care related programs from 13 accounts to four. This initiative reduces general fund all other funding by $17,383,689 in state fiscal years 22 and 23. Final initiative in this section is on page 304 and increases funding for cost of living adjustments for adult family care homes. This initiative increases general fund all other funding by $33,330 in state fiscal year 22, $34,330 in state fiscal year 23. There's also one language uh, piece associated with this section. You can find that on page 33L, part LL. This part updates the uh, United States Department of Labor Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index to be used for cost of living adjustments from the Medical Care Services Index to the Nursing Facility and Adult Daycare Services Index. That's all the initiatives. Thank you for the opportunity to present the governor's proposed budget, or at least part of it, um, for state fiscal year 22 and 23 on behalf of the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Mann. And um, that was a lot of material. Um, so it probably generated a few questions. Um, I'm gonna take the liberty of asking one first because you've mentioned it several times. You're uh, either you have or you're proposing to consolidate 13 programs into four. If you could get to us a like a one pager that explains um, what those programs the, how they were arranged in 13 and how you're proposing to consolidate them into four. Um, that would be great, you know, for the work session. Certainly, we have a crosswalk that maps uh, the current structure to the proposed structure and uh, we can talk about uh, why we're proposing that as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we have four people in the queue and um, I just wanna remind folks that if the, um, if the department doesn't have exactly what you want today, our analysts are tracking this and it will get us uh, that information at a later date. So uh, Representative Craven, and then Hymanson, then Perry, then Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I did have a question about the consolidation as well. So thank you for asking that. Um, but I have a question for on page 271. Uh, regarding the Fund for a Healthy Maine. Is that a new initiative or have we been using that money in, there all the time? Is this, uh, is this new this year? There's, um, I, I um, have not, 
Are you talking about the general appropriation that goes into the baseline for main care on 271 to 31 million? Right. That that's a long standing. There's been a um, uh, there's nothing. There's no new fund for healthy Maine going into main care this year. Those uh, that has been provided in prior years, which is you can see it in 20, and then also in the current fiscal year. Um, um, and we're just carrying that through to fund uh, the appropriate claim services. Okay, thanks. It's actually, I'm, I'm just, we're actually removing a little bit uh, from it in the biennial. Uh, thank you, Representative Hymanson. Thank you, thank you for lots of stuff here. Um, and one of the challenges of this is um, it's such a complicated time in history um, moving in and out. And so my interest has been about the FMAP. Um, uh, when we move money in to support something um, and we move money out, what happens to the money that we're moving out? So FMAP money comes in um, to support something and then that displaces some money. And what, what hap how is that accounted for, the money that's displaced by the FMAP? So I think I'd like to know more about the FMAP um, funding. And I've spent some time with Luke. I think I need to spend a little more time with him um, too to understand this, but I really want to understand it. So I'm putting that out there to you too to help me to understand that. Um, so that's a longer term tutorial for me. Um, but I also have a question about um, the first initiative on page A264 <clears throat> about the 340B um, administered uh, drugs. You said um, you have here that it, it established um, a new reimbursement method methodology. So what allowed you to um, change the methodology? Why has that been changed? Sure. Um, we, the reason why we're proposing this is that it is a CMS requirement. Um, Maine is one of the final states um, in the across the country to um, align the what the um, cost of drugs, uh, what what um, 340B eligible participants are able to pay for uh, manufacturers at a discount rate, um, and aligning that to um, what we reimburse them for. They, there's a uh, a margin there. And we are um, working with CMS um, and providers that are affected by this to, to develop a, a more uh, comprehensive methodology so it reflects the actual costs that are paid. So the methodology now is the cost plus the infusion or the, um, the, give, the cost to give the patient in whatever format the drug is given? There, there isn't a hard and fast methodology um, right now. Um, however, we, the intention of this initiative is to reimburse that, to make it a stronger connection between what the cost of is for these drugs and uh, what is reimbursed from main care. Okay. Um, the, the third initiative this is my last one. Um, about uh, the, pri the um, preferred drug list um, for um, biosimilars. I think that was a law that, is that because of the law? I think it was Representative Perry's bill that no, came in. No, um, this is, uh, there's no law or statutory requirement for this. Um, this was, um, you know, when we were assembling the budget, um, this one just made common sense there. Um, to, to swap out more expensive brand name uh, drugs with biosimilar um, similar ones. And uh, this would, uh, so there shouldn't be any uh, real effect uh, of, for this. And uh, this is just, this isn't, there was some, um, we've talked to um, Maine Hospital Association about this as well, they were concerned that if this was going to affect inpatient drugs and it, and it will not, it's just for outpatient drugs. Okay. Thank you. More to come, but we have time to, to do this late at another Just, time. I mean, um, to your first question, if, if you just want a, a quick overview on FMAP, um, FMAPs are determined on the, across the 
country based on the uh, average per capita income uh, relative across states. So when that drops, which is what happened here in um, fiscal year 2021, federal uh, FMAP, the, what the federal government supports on uh, uh, it increases. So, and then our, our general fund amount decreases. So what we are, we are essentially giving back that general fund amount that we will no longer need. And we're just charging or the, the feds are picking up a higher proportion of those claims that are get billed at regular FMAP. You'll see, a, you know, just to orient you to the to some of the testimony I gave today and uh, more tomorrow, there's a few different dynamics going on with that. There's the regular FMAP, FMAP changes every year. So we, we align general fund, whether it goes up or down, um, it's a net neutral, um, you know, the, the cost of the claims are the same, it's just a proportion that is split between the state and the federal um, arrangement is what changes. Um, and like I said, the federal side is going up. So we have a savings on the general fund side. And, and when we, that initiative would give back that amount of money to the unallocated balance. The, there's that regular FMAP that happens every year. Um, there's also enhanced FMAP. So when we, we expanded and we had main care expansion, there's higher FMAP rates built into that. The state is able to avail themselves of, of a 90% um, FMAP rate and as opposed to what's right around 64%, which is what the feds usually pick up. That 90% allows us to um, develop uh, enhanced FMAP rates, which also gives back uh, money to the general fund, um, which is what we're doing um, in several of the initiatives here. Um, for, you, I, I talked about the prospective interim payments for uh, critical access hospitals as well as supplemental payments for hospitals overall. I, th I think we might have that, but can we have an accounting of that money that's displaced, the unallocated money that's displaced from the, the FMAP? Sure. Thank you. Senator Green, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Representative Perry, and then Representative Cloutier, and then Senator Bailey. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the consolidation of the um, uh, long-term care facilities work, as well as the pharmacy uh, benefits in Medicaid uh, and main care. Um, do these savings reflect savings as a result of changing uh, just more efficient uh, administration? Or are these savings also affect how the programs work and what the benefits look like? Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Representative. The, um, the consolidation account uh, proposal, which is we have a proposal for the general fund accounts as well as the other special revenue accounts um, will not have any impact on uh, uh, on the, the delivery of services. The savings that we offered up, it was $3 million across those accounts, uh, stem from our ability to uh, more closely manage to uh, what we need to across the accounts. Instead of spreading, um, keeping balances in 13 different appropriations, we uh, under this proposal, we would be able to, we would consolidate that and simplify it into four accounts. And, and, um, and as such, we would run, we would be able to um, reserve less funds to make sure that we don't have cycle crashes or other uh, detrimental impacts to, uh, uh, you know, I won't have to come before this committee and ask for supplemental appropriations if we ever ran into that account, uh, into that issue on a, a particular account, there would be, um, because there would be fewer accounts and, and um, more services uh, delivered out of each account, but there would be no, no impact for the, um, on providers or, or the delivery of the services. Thank you. I, I, I would also note that we would, um, the proposal aligns it to the federal side. The federal accounts have far fewer accounts than the state accounts. So it would also 
simplify it in terms of um, tracking purposes and and it would be a, a cleaner alignment between the the state account, the the tax account, and then the federal account as well. Representative Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I may be reaching out similar to Representative Hymanson uh, for a real sort of basic tutorial on a, a lot of these things because I um, feel like a very lay person on a lot of these topics. Um, on page A266, we talk about the pharmacy incentive payment. And I'm just wondering if you could give a real brief overview of that. Uh, certainly, and I'm uh, happy to share what I know with, uh, for primers or anything. I, I apologize for reading so quickly after you uh, mentioned that, Senator Claxton. I, I uh, realized I was reading rather quickly, so sorry about that. Um, but for the pharmacy incentive payment, again, um, um, the are you the there's um. It's not necessarily the initiative itself, but kind of like back it up a little bit more than that and tell me what that actually is. Sure. So um, for retail pharmacies um, that uh, dispense drugs, so there's a dispensing fee that they um, that they are paid through uh, the main care insurance program. Um, that's for, you know, the pharmacist and actually packaging up the drug and um, and delivering it to to the patient or the um, the customer. So the uh, original uh, dispensing fee uh, was rather low. It was three dollars and thirty cents. Um, that changed in twenty eighteen um, to um, eleven dollars and eighty nine cents, I believe. Um, um, and you know, prior to 2018, that fee was um, w at that level. There was a, we put in place a rural dispensing add-on fee. So essentially, rural providers had a 55 cent per dis uh, per drug dispensing um, fee add-on to that three dollars and thirty cents. Since that that rural incentive fee still remains, even though the dispensing fee incre uh, increased by three x or so. Um, so we are proposing to uh, eliminate the rural dispensing fee add-on, and then we're also marginally reducing the overall dispensing fee to uh, from $11.89 to $10.59, so just around a little less than 10%. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Mann, I don't know if you've seen the testimony from AARP, uh, but they talk about a uh, concern about uh, expanding Medicaid estate recovery to going after 55 to 64 year olds who sign up for health care. And um, so I have two questions. One is, is that initiative what we're seeing at the bottom of A270? And if it's not, then do you know where that is located? Um, thanks for that question. Um, our th that initiative on A two hundred and seventy um, actually does the exact has the exact opposite intent. We um, we right now um, we would are required to recover more than the federal minimum for a state recovery if. Um, if the member owes money back to the state. Um, so this initiative actually um, provides general funds to replace those recoveries that uh, main care would go after if there was debts owed to them um, and reduces it to the federal minimum. So we are removing any, any disincentive for members to um, come onto main care because they might have concerns around a state recovery uh, um, after the fact. So this is something that we would uh, like to do. We proposed it in the supplemental last year as well. And um, I think you know, events conspired to uh, having a short, shorter session than we would have liked, but we are reproposing it uh, here in the biennial again. All right, thank you. 
Senator Claxton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, uh, I'm one of those people who needs to see the forest before they can really understand the trees or get into the trees. So I could use some help with some of the roll-ups. I think uh, Representative Hymanson mentioned uh, the FMAP roll-up. I'd love to see how that's parsed. And um, I also would like to see what the impact is to the various sections that are mentioned as we go through the budget, like 21, 29, 19, 97 CND. I want to understand what the impact to those to those kinds of th those are. And uh, I'd love to understand better the consolidation of four to one and 13 to four over time. So thank you. Or like we can provide that. Um, the just because you mentioned the uh, sections twenty one and twenty nine, the waiver services for developmentally disabled adults. Um, I, I believe that is the largest single initiative that we're proposing. We're proposing a um, a rate increase of uh, nine million and change or so, general fund only, um, starting in the biennial. Um, so, but we can get to uh, more information on that as well. Um, Representative Millett, is, did you have a question? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, Deputy Commissioner Mann, I, I think um, most of us found this overwhelming in terms of your ability to speed read pages in front of us without a whole lot of rationale and context. And I'm, I'm hoping that the questions you're hearing from us now are not designed to, um, to displace or to, to disagree with what you're doing, but more to get an understanding of the why that follows, that underlies the changes. So I have four different areas that I, I thought I would just raise, hoping that in the work session, you could respond to them. They're, they're pretty much of a cross-cutting type. The first one is to utilize the crosswalk approach to identifying those few instances where there were offsetting initiatives, where uh, increase in one initiative is matched by a decrease in another, just so we could see them and be able to deal with them in our work sessions. The second one was to see uh, the, on the rate changes that Senator Claxton just referenced, how much of the changes or specifically where are the changes made in, in context to or in follow up to the money we provided back on March 17th as a support funding for rate changes? And, and um, maybe just putting that in context, just identifying the uh, extent of the study, the areas where rates are proposed for increase and the dollar amount that underlies those requests. The third, is to get a handle on, since we're still dealing with the supplemental and haven't yet gone through the report back, how many initiatives are, are contained within what you have spoken to today that were also included in the supplemental? In other words, I, I noted a few, for example, the bed hold days and, and a few others that seem to be similar to what was proposed in the supplemental. And I guess my last question, well, next to last, um, both Senator Claxton and Representative Hymanson referenced the FMAP changes for the upcoming biennium. Would you give us the specific percentage that will go into effect, I assume, on October 1 of this coming fall in relation to where we were before the 6.2% expansion and utilizing the base that occurred or existed last October 1, just so we get a handle on it. I know staff usually does that and it would be helpful to see the, uh, as you said, the per capita income changes, whether we're trending in a direction that is beneficial to Maine or uh, the opposite. And finally, just as a question, I seem to remember some comments in the last uh, session about CMS challenging our use of the PNMI model. And since there are several initiatives that utilize it, I just wanna know if there's, if we are clean and, and outside or above any challenge by CMS to the concept of the PNMI model. Um, I'll stop there and just say, I'm not, 
trying to be um, questioning of your proposal. I'm just overwhelmed by the speed with which you read. And I'm sure we're gonna get the same kind of present uh, presentation tomorrow. Uh, we got new members on both committees. I'm sure they're as overwhelmed as I am. So I'm just trying to be constructive. Thank you. Certainly. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, I apologize if I read too quickly. I, I, the, um, my understanding is we just get through the budget of how it is written and then I'm happy to answer questions and dive into more detail on particular topics or areas. And then also we can do that in the work sessions, obviously. Um, just to answer a couple of your questions, if you want off the top, I, I'm happy to go through FMAP and I know FMAP can be confusing. Um, and there's different types of FMAP changes that are happening. There's like, I, I mentioned that there's the regular FMAP, FMAP changes every single year. Um, and so that that is happening um, since the start of the, the pandemic since the declared uh, public health emergency, the federal government increased FMAP for all states by 6.2 percentage points. So that has been, um, you know, whatever our FMAP was before, if it was 36% state, 64% federal government, we just add 6.2% on the federal side, bring it up to 70% or so, and decrease the state share down to 30% or so, which generates general fund savings. Uh, potentially, uh, I say potentially because that FMAP uh, bump is intended to protect healthcare coverage during a public health uh, emergency. We are prohibited from closing out or terminating anyone off of main care services during the declared public health emergency. And so enrollment grows, enrollment's up 14% or so. Um, in February of 2020, we were at right around 300,000 people and we're at 340,000 now. Um, same thing is happening on expansion. So that FMAP bump is primarily intended to, um, you know, protect against enrollment, uh, the cost of enrollment gains, whether it's the maintenance of effort, which is that requirement to keep people on, to keep people coverage during a health emergency, but also um, Medicaid rolls across the country typically increase what and there's a downturn. We are a counter cyclical economic cycle here, obviously, as uh, people lose their jobs or otherwise have um, economic impacts um, and may, may come onto the roles of main care. Um, so there's that, that's sort of just a quick couple thoughts on the 6.2% FMAP. And I, I mentioned the enhanced FMAP on not all not all FMAPs um, are the same percentage. There's higher FMAP rates. Some of them are 90-10 split. Federal government picks up 90% of the cost for certain um, programs um, like expansion, um, which is why we're able to reallocate funds um, across that and, and generate general fund savings. But we can, um, we can summarize all of that. So it's, I realize the budget is, um, dispersed across the counts, but we can consolidate that so that we can have a more comprehensive and thorough discussion on those particular topics in one place. Your final point, um, um, to, since you brought it up the, um, on the PNMI service provider tax disagreement we've been having with CMS, I will mention that we did, uh, we issued a report to this committee and the tax committee last uh, March um, about alternatives, and there was some, um, um, we, uh, per, per our, um, we put that in the uh, biennial budget uh, in 2021, but on December 28th of, uh, just before New Year's this year, about, uh, you know, a month and a half ago, we did receive a deferral from CMS related to the um, service provider tax for the, the PNMIs. That was $4.2 million for the quarter ending September 30th. So if you annualize that, that's about $17 million um, uh, annual cost to the state. And we continue to uh, disagree with CMS. We think the, the service provider tax is an allowable, uh, permissible source of state revenue to fund Medicaid. Um, but we are working with the attorney general shop and uh, uh, and working with CMS on on working uh, working through those issues. Thank you, Mr. Mann.
Senator Breen, I think you're on mute again. Thank you. Um, I just want to apprise folks on uh, the AFA committee that um, during our first few weeks together where we were holding briefings, we were hoping to have DHHS come and brief us on the rate study. Um, they weren't quite ready to do that. And I understand <laughs> at some point they'll be briefing the HHS committee. Um, but I think that it would do us all some good to, to get a, a briefing of, roll, of how that's gonna roll out. So um, we will work on that as um, chairs of the committee. Um, so I'm gonna, I see uh, Representative Martin and then Representatives Fay, Meyer and Cardone in the queue. Representative Martin, you're on mute. You need to take off your mute button. Nope, not yet. Still can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay, I should be on. There you go. Thank okay. you. Go back to A270, uh, which is the uh, federal. I'm assuming that uh, what you're recommending is what we almost uh, what we did and before we adjourned, but it never made law. And that's the uh, people who get main care at home, that would not be recoverable. The recoverable portion would be nursing home, uh, et cetera. Is that correct? That's generally accurate, yes. Okay, the second question would be, I wonder if you'd have time or someone might in the office make a listing of all the general funds in the budget that are being supplanted by the FMAP. Uh, not necessarily where you're recommending it goes, but the amount of money that bank care, uh, I'm sorry, that the FMAP is replacing general fund money and how much. Thank you. Yep. Um, so part of the, we can put together a, a summary of the various types of FMAP changes that are occurring and the dollar value of that and the dollar value that um, the feds are now covering for main care claims instead of state general fund. And, right. And uh, necessarily where you're going to now replace what you're going to do with the general fund, but we know that general fund money is going to be somewhere. A table with that would be great. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm trying to figure out what is the most efficient way to ask the questions that I have. And I think I'll start with the cost of living increase for nursing facilities, which is uh, A282. And I think I'd like to understand a little bit more about what that means, um, who the cost of living is for, is that a cost of living increase for the residents or is that a cost of living increase for the facilities? And then um, is there a corollary cost of living increase for home and community-based services or any sort of rate increase included? I couldn't, I, we went through so fast, it was really hard for me to see um, specifically around sections uh, 19 and 63. Um, I know that there's a significant wait list for the homemaker program. And so was curious how that was treated here. Sure, uh, thanks for that. Um, the cost of living increases um, for the nursing facilities, those go to the facilities themselves. We we don't pay nursing uh, residents. We all of, uh, for, State fiscal year 2020 main care. Um, you know the department paid nursing facilities about 349 million dollars all funds. Uh, that's made up of a portion of uh, general fund, federal funds, and then the um, taxes that are paid in. Um, but these rate increases, uh, you can think about changes to the rates for nursing facilities um, um, in two ways. We 
In even years, we uh, typically uh, provide a cost of living adjustment, uh, a COLA to the facilities based on uh, published BLS uh, CPI guidance, um, consumer price index guidance. Um, can we, yeah, I was going to say, can we can we try to? Some of us don't know all the acronyms, so if you can, <laughs> what, I don't know what BLS is. I'm sorry. A Bureau of Labor Statistics okay. uh, consumer price index. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So that's a published rate, and we um, and that's the four million dollars that you see um, there for general fund. That's just a general fund portion. There's the federal funds of, you know, another eight and a half million federal funds. So there, you know, overall that cost of living increase will increase nursing facility reimbursement payments uh, by $13 million or so in fiscal 22. Um, and in the odd years, we do another inflation adjustment and then we rebase. Uh, and what rebase nursing facility rebasing is we, um, it's, it's a little complicated, but the, um, we take a look at uh, total costs um, from um, a prior fiscal year that nursing facilities had, and then we factor those in um, to the rebase year so that we will basically um, capture costs that were um, either not reimbursed because they are uh, capped or um, but a rebasing will increase uh, nursing facility reimbursement uh, significantly, usually um, uh, far more than the cost of living adjustment, um, which is what's happening here as well. So um, those are the two, the two changes to the nursing facility rates. I'll, I'll mention that LD925, which passed in 2018, made that rebasing a biannual uh, every two years. Uh, in prior year, prior to that, the department proposed uh, rebasing, um, but it is now uh, in per that law. Um, it happens every two years. <clears throat> so um, the section nineteen you asked about, um, there was an increase in that program. Um, in the supplemental budget that passed last year. Um, and there's another one um, in the biennial, uh, but um, I, there's, uh, we don't have a corresponding increase to 63 included here. Okay. And also, also I, in LD925, there were rate, there were increases in section 21 and 22 in that bill as well. Sorry, Representative Faye, go ahead. That's okay. No, I, I was just, so, but was there a, I guess, I guess you answered my question in a way because there was no, you didn't mention that there was a uh, cost of living increase that's a corollary for home and community-based services, um, but just for um, nursing facilities. Um, that's, Right, the, the okay. total okay. for multiple, and I misspoke, there's no, there's no rating, the rate increases that are included in the biennial budget are um, 21 and 29. Um, those rate increases, uh, I, Jeff can check me, I believe they're around $40 million annually, all funds, but it might be 30. Um, the, um, the cost of living adjustments are, um, you know, we, we have cost of living adjustments included for FQHCs, the federally qualified health centers, the rural health clinics, um, adult family care homes, nursing facilities, PNMICs. Um, those are all more residential based uh, services, um, bricks and mortar, if you will. Um, there was, a, but there is that, um, that sizable uh, rate increase due to minimum wage. Um, requirements and um, alignment with um, alignment with the community supports that were put in place for uh, during the bi uh, supplemental initiative last last year um, that are now carried through for 21 and 29 as opposed to mostly on 18 and 19 and 20 last year okay so I guess I guess 
I just want to get clear in my head that we don't do any kind of automatic cost of living increase for home and community based services, but mostly for uh, different different residential settings. Is that uh, fair? I would agree with that, yes. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so I have next up uh, Representative Meyer and then Representative Cardone. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Mann, for being here today. On page 249, there, there's a reduction in funding of $5 million a year um, for the statewide tobacco prevention and treatment programs um, compared to uh, the level of funding in the current year. Um, so that uh, that would be a th that would reflect a thirty six percent cut in funding to that program. So what I'd like to know is what the five million dollars per year uh, in FY twenty twenty one. What were the efforts of the tobacco uh, control and uh, um, prevention and treatment program so that I could better understand what they may no longer have funding for to continue? Uh, we can certainly uh, get that information for you. Um, we That wasn't part of my testimony today. I think we're covering that tomorrow morning, although we would have covered it yesterday. Um, and that is I'm sorry, I'm just looking at it right now. Um, if, if I'm um, to fund for healthy Maine. Um, yes. The, so fund for healthy Maine um, has um, constraints on it because there are, there's a separately allocated and appropriated dollars that, that fund that. Um, and we have, um, there's going to be more constraints on FHM dollars, Fund for Healthy Maine dollars going forward into the future, since we have um, those sources are not uh, being replenished at the same rate as they are being spent. So we, the, irrespective of that dynamic going on, so we're gonna have to make choices around Fund for Healthy Maine in the future. This is more of a DAFs issue, but you know, DHHS is a, is a large user of those Fund for Healthy Maine dollars naturally. Um, we did, I wouldn't, um, w without a doubt, the, the funding is coming out, but those funds were appropriated um, by the legislature in the first place on a one-time basis. So they were appropriated in the last biennial and we, there isn't sufficient funds. We have to make choices in, in Fund for Healthy Maine um, because the, the sources don't align to the ongoing uses um, that we intend to use it for. But we will certainly, um, I can get you a a better, uh, better insight into the use of those $5 million um, in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21. Thank you. And uh, Representative Meyer, I just want to let you know that OFPR, the office that staffs appropriations also has a long set of charts and, and so on on Fund for Healthy Maine that um, would give you some longevity of how the fund has been used and grown or drip or drop. So we can get that to you as well. Um, Representative Cardone. Uh, Representative Cardone, are you ready? Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sorry, Representative Cardone. And I mean this as... I think she's frozen. Um, so, so, Representative Cardone, could you hold on a minute? Um, I'm going to ask some of our fellow members to just turn off their videos and see if that helps with Representative Cardone's... Um, I have no scientific reason to think that, but just anecdotally to see if that will help Representative Cardone's audio and video come through any better. So um, Representative Cardone, would you mind starting again? I cannot hear you at all. Uh, 
Um, Representative Cardone, I still cannot hear you. I'm not sure she's still here. Oh, maybe that's I why I can't hear her. Her, um, she was having internet issues earlier today. So okay. Maybe we can move forward and if she comes back, I'll text her. Okay. Um, while we're waiting uh, to see if Representative Cardone is coming back, are there any, she was the last legislator I had in the queue for questions to the department. Um, are there any other questions for the department um, before we move on to public comment? If so, please put your cursor down at the bottom of your screen and do your raised hand function. Okay, I don't see any, um, but if Representative Cardone comes back, we hope that that will work out. So, oh, there she I, is. I am back. Oh, good. The floor is yours. I apologize. I seem to be having internet connectivity issues here. Uh, I think it may be the wind that's actually jostling the cables. Um, I uh, Is Mr. Mann still on? I'm here. Yes. I think she froze again. Uh, Representative Cardone, I'm sorry, but we can't hear you again. Um, so I guess I, I guess what I would suggest is that you write down your questions um, so that we can make sure we capture them and get get the information some other way. All right, am I, can you hear me? Not really, you're just barely, no. we can hear something, but I, I can't hear much content of what you're saying. Madam Chair? Yes. If, if Representative Cardone turns off her own video, that may actually help her with her audio. Okay. Representative Cardone, you want to try that? Turn off your video and just try your audio. Unfortunately, I don't hear anything. I think, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. I've been texting with her and I think we'll get her questions and we'll make sure they get answered. We have a couple more days with HHS. No doubt we can get them in. Great. Okay. Um, so that leads to the next part of the meeting where we'll be hearing from uh, the public and uh, we'll be taking public testimony. And I have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I believe, eight, eight or nine folks here to testify. And I'm gonna take them in the order they appear on my screen. And so the first one will be Brenda Gallant, and then Donald Hardin, and then Jeff Austin. And um, Ms. Gallant, just hang on a second. I'm going to change you over to, oh, looks like maybe somebody already did that. Uh, change you over to make you a, uh, a panelist. There you are. Okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Senator Breen, Representative Purse. Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, committee members. My name is Brenda Gallant. I'm the long-term care ombudsman. First, uh, we oppose the elimination of reimbursement for direct care days uh, during bed hold days in nursing facilities. And we testified, you'll recall our testimony on the supplemental budget in opposition to this. We support the proposed funding included in the budget for nursing facilities. We believe it's important that some of these funds be tied to wage increases for staff in order to support the recruitment and retention of direct care staff as well as ancillary staff in order to encourage recruitment and retention of staff. Maine nursing homes, as you probably know, serve residents with among the highest acuity in the country. Historically, we've had very high staffing levels, which has really um, has really promoted quality of care for residents. So it's important that we maintain staffing ratios to provide care for residents. This has become even more important. As you know, families have been separated from residents because of restrictions, which were required as a result of the pandemic. 
Many nursing facilities have been forced to use staffing agencies, which has been much more expensive. I had a, um, an administrator tell me that it was $50 an hour for a CNA, $95 an hour for, for a nurse. Many um, staff will go to the staffing agencies because they can get higher wages um, through these agencies. Also, um, staff that work for larger um, providers that can provide um, higher benefits and wages um, will attract these staff. So in order to maintain staffing, it's really important that we invest in these workers. So staffing availability not only impacts quality of care, it also impacts access to care at the nursing home level. This has been a statewide issue as a result of the pandemic. Hospitals report that they've seen an increase in um, patients ready for discharge where it took more than 30 days to get admission to a nursing facility, for example, for skilled care. The ombudsman program also saw this in our experience. It also means that people in the community um, are having some barriers in terms of accessing this level of care. And we found this is true even when people are willing to go across the state. So really my point really is to say, I wanna see as much as we can an investment in, in these um, direct care staff uh, members in order to create access and assure quality of care. Um, and to also to representative phase point earlier, it's important as well that we invest in home care staff um, both in section 19, section 63, um, because these programs also um, have issues around attracting staff. And I know there'll be other speakers behind me that will say there are many hours a week that go unstaffed and people are at risk in the community without sufficient staff. I also wanna make the point that um, there is a waiting list of 796 individuals, older and disabled adults, that are in the community that qualify for the state-funded home-based care program. These are people that need home care services um, and their income is above name care and they're just waiting in the community um, without services. And I don't see any increase in the budget for this program. Um, and I think it's important that if you have some extra funds that you, that you find, that I think this would be a very good investment when people are in the community and they cannot access services, it really does place them at risk. We've seen people have to go into a facility when they have not been able to access care. So that in my three minutes, I didn't wanna take up too much time, but thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Gallant. Any questions from committee members, either HHS or appropriations for Ms. Gallant? Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, next, we have um, Donald Hardin, and I'm going to move him over, to, uh, hang on just a second, over to panelist and um, ask him to uh, turn on his mic. There he is. Good afternoon, Mr. Hardin. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senators Breen and Claxton, Representatives Pierce and Meyer. And members of the committees. My name is Don Harden, and I'm presenting testimony on behalf of Catholic Charities Maine, an agency I've been affiliated with for over 41 years, most recently as Director of Aging Services. As one of Maine's largest community based social services agencies, we provided help and hope to nearly 102,000 Mainers last year. Important part of our mission is providing services to older Mainers. Uh, that includes the Independent Support Services Program, more popularly known as the State Homemaker Program, a state-funded service uh, funded under Section 69. The ISS Program assists individuals who otherwise could not live independently with such things as housekeeping, laundry, meal preparation, grocery shopping, and transportation for errands and appointments. Last year, we served 21, 30 consumers in all 16 counties. And we continue to provide those services during the pandemic. And I put some details about the services provided under COVID in my written testimony. Uh, but we certainly celebrate both the resilience of our consumers and the courage and compassion of our direct care workers who are truly on the front line of essential health and human services during this time. I commend the governor and the biennial budget being presented, but also want to highlight what we see as missing 
more initiatives to address the growing direct care worker crisis affecting access to essential services across the spectrum of human need. During 2019, I served on the commission to study long-term care workforce issues. We released our report listing 29 recommendations in January of 2020. At that time, our report detailed unstaffed hours and wait lists for services and the demographics of a rapidly aging state, predicting that the mismatch between services needed and workers available will only become more acute. As I sit here a year later, it has gotten more acute. As a provider of homemaker services, we are facing the continuing and growing challenges of direct care worker shortages. We have people on our wait list and unstaffed list because we can't hire enough staff. At the end of January, we had an unstaffed list of 287 consumers and a wait list of 1,058. People that we just can't serve because we can't get the, the people. This will only get worse as our workforce age and demand for services increase. Consumers are not able to access adequate in-home care or place at risk and diminish quality of life, end up accessing local ER visits and hospital stays and place in higher level, more expensive care unnecessarily, sometimes because their family members can't do it anymore at great public and personal cost. Homemaker services is the front end of the long-term continuum, the least expensive form of intervention. I also uh, put some comments about the impact on the economy uh, when family members can't access uh, needed care. As a program, we've taken extraordinary steps to try to keep up with the forces making it difficult to compete for workforce within the limits of current reimbursement. When the commission report was released a year ago and included recommendations that needed to be implemented immediately. These included increases in reimbursement necessary to increase wages for direct care workers to no less than 125% of the minimum wage and to cover structural additions to provider costs to compete in provider budgets with necessary spending on recruitment and retention. There is an initiative to review rates of reimbursement, but rate review for long-term services and supports is not going to happen soon enough to address what is an immediate crisis. The urgency is now. I urge consideration of rate increases for essential LTSS services for this biennial budget. And at that, I thank you for all your services to Maine citizens. Thank you, Mr. Hardin. We're really glad you could join us today. Are there any questions for Mr. Hardin from any of the committee meeting the committee members? If there are, please go down to the bottom of your screen and press the with your cursor and press the raise hand function. I am not seeing any, um, so I will ask um, Mr. Hardin to sign off or we're gonna move you back over to uh, attendance mm -hmm. and thank you very, very much. Uh, next in the queue are uh, Jeff Austin and Jess uh, Moore Mauer. It's either Moore. So hang on, Mr. Austin, I'm gonna move you over to panelist. And um, Jess Moore will be uh, next. There he is. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, go right ahead. Senators Breen and Claxton, Representatives Person Meyer, members of the committee, committees. My name is Jeff Austin. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Hospital Association. I'm here to express our opposition to two specific items uh, that you heard today. Our opening statement on the biennial budget is similar to our opening statement on the supplemental, that overall it's a responsible, essentially flat status quo budget, but there are a few initiatives that are negative for hospitals. I've submitted three pages of written testimony. I hope you've received it. Um, if not, I, I can resubmit. I went through the 100 pages of DHHS items in the biennial budget, and it looks to me like there are 235 separate initiatives. Most are ministerial, several are increases in spending, a few are actually no change. There are about a dozen what I would call policy initiatives out of 235 total. A dozen that cut um, third parties, 
a high number of those are impacting us. And I'd like to speak to you about two of them today. I won't revisit on page two, the hospital financial condition. I testified to you on the supplemental budget and went through some of the hardships that hospitals like others have faced during the pandemic. Suffice it to say our losses for the year are still in the hundreds of millions. The first cut I'd like to speak to you about is on page A264. It's the cut to outpatient reimbursement at hospitals for 340B drugs. This was in the governor's curtailment order, and it was also in the supplemental budget. This is a cut of $7 million per year to hospitals. By my best estimate, this is the largest policy cut in the entire DHHS budget. I've put into italics my testimony on the supplemental. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Health and Human Services Committee during their review, uh, they voted against this proposal. I believe it was unanimous. I'd like to express our appreciation on behalf of hospitals for that. I would like to note and remind you that sometimes the department describes things differently than we do. They often talk about the general fund savings to the state, which from this initiative is $2 million per year. But the loss to hospitals is 7 million per year because of the lost match from the federal government. I'm happy to go around the barn on what the 340B program is, whether this methodology change in fact has to be done. We disagree with the department over that. And we can, we can go around the barn on the 340B program and what the methodology needs to be. Another alternative for you is to simply tell them, even if a methodology change is somehow required by CMS. CMS is not requiring the state to pocket the money. Any savings that materialize could be redirected back into hospital outpatient rates, which the DHHS rate study just showed. Hospital outpatient rates in Maine are below cost, below commercial rates, below uh, Medicaid rates in other states. Page three of my testimony, the last um, page of my testimony is on two components of essentially the same initiative. It's the hospital tax and match program. Part of it is on page 267. The other part is on 268. For those of you who don't know, the state of Maine imposes a tax on hospital revenues. The tax generates approximately $115 million, 115. It is a rather significant tax. A portion of that funding that the state receives is used to reimburse hospitals through what's called a supplemental payment system. It's also sometimes called match. The total amount of supplemental payments does not equal the total amount of tax. So at the end of the day, hospitals in Maine lose $23 million from this program. That's a little unusual nationally. Lots of states have these programs. They're called provider assessments. And in most states, the providers are held harmless. That's true for nursing homes in this state. They pay a tax, but all the money stays with them. The biennial budget proposes to increase the tax by $11.8 million. That's what's on page 267. A portion of that money is then used to increase supplemental payments by $11.3 million. That's on page 268. So you put those two together and you'll see a net loss of $500,000 for hospitals. Our request to you on this initiative is not to get rid of the tax increase, but to simply make the supplemental payment sufficient to cover the increase. I've given you a table where I think I've accurately described what's been proposed by DHHS and what our request is. For $150,000, you can make us whole and get rid of this half million dollar cut to hospitals. I'd be happy to explain either of those further. Um, please oppose these two cuts. Uh, please carry forward the HHS recommendation on the supplemental and do not impose a $7 million 
cut to 340B and do not force us to endure a half million dollar loss on the tax and match program. We are still trying to understand some of the initiatives better. We, we don't know for sure, but there may be some other initiatives discussed today that we don't have the detail on that negatively impact hospitals. Um, if we determine that through the course of work sessions, we will provide you something in writing along those lines. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I have a question, Mr. Austin. Have there been negotiations between the hospitals and the administration and the department on the 340B? Have you had the benefit of trying to sit down and work it out? We've had communications. Um, it's more along the lines, when this was announced in September as part of the curtailment order, we were in immediate communications trying to figure out what, what they were going to do. And 340B, it's a federal program. It's very complicated. It's a very difficult program, but it's a great program in that it's the federal government requiring pharmaceutical companies to give certain providers a discount. It's a very successful program. Pharmaceutical companies don't like it and they're attacking it in Washington, but it's a complicated program. And so we've had more, I'd say, discussions with them about what they are trying to do. Negotiations over not doing it, less so. We would like them to not do it. They're very good to us in terms of communications, but they have not signaled to us that they um, are going to reverse course. Our understanding is they may need to adopt some methodology, but we are not convinced that they have to adopt a methodology that produces a cut. Again, even if they do, you don't have to take the money. You can use the money to hold us harmless and put it back into outpatient rates, which are low. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Austin from either committee? Not seeing any. Um, so, oh, Representative Hymanson, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this, um, Mr. Austin. Um, there's a history to all of these. Um, every session, we've been talking about the provider tax and um, the 340B less so. That's kind of more new to me. Correct. Do you have a, a, a history? Can you re remind me about the history of the, the provider tax? Because um, we did do something last session about um, something. If you could remind me, you don't have to do it now, but um, sure. It, talk later, I, I can. I think it's fairly quick and simple. The tax has been around since the '90s. It's changed a little bit over the years, but it is something that the federal government has allowed, but then regulated. Our program, we believe, is in compliance. Is in compliance with federal law. Um, the thing I think you might be thinking of, Representative Hymanson, I'm not sure, is two years ago when the hospital tax was rebased, the match did not equal the tax. You were on the HHS committee at the time. You voted to require that the match equal the tax. That did not happen ultimately with appropriations. They did not take your recommendation on that. So over the years, that those little changes, this half million here, it was, I think, $2 million two years ago. It adds up to now we're suffering a $23 million a year loss. I would love for you to reverse the loss in its entirety. Our request, I think, is more modest. Please don't add to that loss this year. Okay, thank you. I'm in a different part of the sausage machine. now. Good luck. <laughs> Um, any other questions for Mr. Austin? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move on now to Jess Maurer and then Katie Harris. And Ms. Maurer should be here and I hope she's gonna start by correcting the way I say her name. Here she is. Here I am. 
Thank you. So uh, esteemed members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Health and Human Services, my name is Jess Maurer and I am the Executive Director of the Maine Council on Aging. I am testifying in favor of LD 221, although we are urging amendments to this bill that would um, significant, make significant in, uh, investments in Maine's essential care workforce and address the existing uh, anticipated wait list for critical services. As we share um, three important beliefs, uh, we share three important beliefs, sorry. Uh, we believe in a strong Maine economy, uh, in the ability of Mainers to find solutions to difficult challenges, uh, and also in the importance of justice. I wanted to start with justice and to ask you uh, to please right the wrong, that the harm that is being done to thousands of older Mainers who are not getting the care they are eligible to receive, putting them and our economy at risk. Each week, 10,000 10, hours of approved care goes undelivered to older and disabled Mainers due to staffing shortages. Last week, 538 older Mainers, most of whom are nursing home eligible, have not received any staffing at all. There are, as you just heard, 1,000 people waiting to access the Homemaker Program. 250 of their clients currently are without any staffing. Nearly 800 older people are waiting to access home and community support services. The wait list is now higher than the number of people being served. This fall, thousands of new Meals on Wheels recipients who qualify for the program will be told that they can no longer get the meals they're currently getting because funding has run out. We are also warehousing older people in hospitals because there, uh, while there are empty beds in nursing homes and assisted living facilities due to staffing shortages. The 2020 Long-Term Supports and Services Scorecard ranks Maine 44th in the nation for affordability and accessibility. Uh, we're 47th regarding the cost of private pay nursing home care and 50th regarding the cost of private pay home care. In short, the cost of long-term supports and services in Maine exceeds the budgets of most Maine households. This isn't a problem with people not working hard enough or family not stepping up. This is about Maine's workforce crisis, an undervalued segment of workers, and a historic lack of investment in low-cost interventions that support healthy aging. These are problems that no one individual can solve. Justice demands, however, that when we know people are going without the services that they're qualified to receive and need in order to live, we must act to correct the harm being caused. We live in a market-driven economy where government pays, when government pays less than market rate for services that businesses uh, that rely for who, who when they pay uh, less than market rate for services, this puts businesses that rely on government contracts at a competitive disadvantage. Currently, care providers are serving all of the people they can serve within the funding being provided. This means older people will simply go without care unless we increase funding for essential care workers. We also must bring equity into this conversation. The care workforce is dominated by women, often women of color and women who are new to this country, and they are historically underpaid for this work. Older people and people with disabilities and behavioral health challenges are often not valued as productive. Economists believe that a significant investment in our social infrastructure, in other words, the care economy, during a time of economic downturn and high unemployment has the potential to create thousands of good paying quality jobs. And this is the sort of investment that also has the potential of narrowing the gender and racial pay gaps, addressing historic inequities and expanding overall household income. Critically important, investing in lower cost, higher value care pays dividends. Meals on Wheels and in-home care increases health and decreases and, and reduces avoidable health care and facility care utilization, both the most expensive kinds of care we have. I'm asking you to work together to build an equitable and just budget that shows uh, the innovative confidence uh, we Mainers have in our ability to solve challenges. Uh, I ask, I have absolute faith in your ability and I ask you uh, to please, in consideration of these requested amendments, vote in favor of LD 221. Uh, and that's, I think my three minutes uh, and I've provided a lot more testimony uh, in, in writing. Thank you, Ms. Maurer. Any uh, questions for Ms. Maurer from the committee? Uh, not seeing any. So thank you very, very much. Glad you could join us today. Um, next is gonna be uh, Katie Harris and then Lori Belden.
And I'm moving Ms. Harris over to um, panelist. Good afternoon. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, Senator Breen, Senator Claxton, Representative Purse, Representative Meyer, distinguished members of the committee. I am Katie Fulham Harris and I am with Maine Health. And I am here to testify um, in support of portions of the budget and, um, and also with concerns around other portions of the budget. Maine Health is Maine's largest integrated healthcare system. We are a nonprofit and we provide a full continuum of care services to the residents of 11 counties in Maine and one in New Hampshire. Um, and I think importantly during the pandemic, we are, our hospitals and healthcare system has played a really vital role, both in providing treatment to individuals with COVID-19. We've treated about 62% of hospitalized patients statewide as of the end of January. Um, our full service lab, which is Nordex, has processed over 414,000 um, COVID tests, which has been key to keeping the pandemic under control. And over the last two months, and as part of our mission of working together so our communities are the healthiest in America, we have really engaged full on in setting up vaccination sites in each one of our local health service areas. And we will have the capacity to serve 25,000 people at those sites um, if we get enough vaccine to do so. And that will involve being staffed by 750 care team members every day um, to, to serve those sites. So um, really important. And we know that this is a, a difficult year for Maine by anyone's standards for our nation. We appreciate the challenging environment um, in which the state finds itself and with reduced revenues and uncertain times uh, in the future. The and we are supportive. I think the governor's budget really does attempt to walk a fine line in this uncertain economy. And in many respects, it does so successfully. But as you heard from Mr. Austin, it contains cuts to the healthcare system that we can ill afford. And at this juncture, we are estimating that the net impact of the pandemic will be about 175 million for Maine Health. And that's in the negative. And I say net because it's net of the provider relief funds that we've received from the federal government, as well as some limited funds from the state. So that is a significant, significant hit. Um, I'm not going to repeat um, the issues that Mr. Austin raised related to the 340B program. It is a tremendously important program for Maine Health and any reductions to that program are hugely pro uh, problematic for us. Uh, the impact, as he noted, is really about $2 million in annual savings to the state, but nearly $7 million for, for Maine's hospitals. I do want to mention that the budget also proposes to develop a preferred drug list, which I heard you mention earlier um, when in questions to Mr. Mann. Um, and that actually uh, is an is a additional problem for us in that if main care is collecting the rebates for those drugs, it will then disallow hospitals ability to carve them in at the 340B rates and the cost savings will go to the state rather than hospitals. So once again, um, that's just another example of a cut to hospitals that we think is unnecessary that's included in the budget. Um, on the tax and match side, currently, the tax for Maine Health is about $6 million. The proposed change in the budget is adds an incremental $5 million to Maine Health uh, liability. And so we fully support uh, Mr. Austin's suggestion that if we're to participate in this program, it is only reasonable that the state provide a match that is at least equivalent to the tax at the state level. On the bed hold days issue, um, that it's hugely, hugely important to us. Right now, the payments ensure that nursing facilities hold beds open for patients when they're admitted to the hospital so that when they're ready for discharge, we have a, they can go home, essentially. They can go back to their nursing facility, which is their home. And right now, um, even pre, this was an issue preceding COVID, and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. On any given day right now, we have about 50 patients stuck at Maine Medical Center awaiting discharge to a sniff or a NIF. So if this payment is eliminated, it's really going to serve to exacerbate that problem even further. 
we have real concerns there. And then I just wanted to note um, a population health payment that is a, a small line item, but it's a it's something that we wanted to call attention to. Um, it the the budget proposes to uh, collapse, I would say, uh, several different existing primary care incentive programs, including health homes, primary care case management, um, and to collapse them into a population health payment program. Maine Health is a strong provider and advocate for primary care, um, and we're intrigued by the proposal, but we really hope that the department actually works with us to develop a population health incentive model that's successful for patients as well as providers. Um, so would ask for your support in, in requesting that the department actually reach out to us and, and work collaboratively to create such a program. So I appreciate your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions and look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Any questions from the committee members for Ms. Harris? Um, not seeing any, uh, either electronic hands or, or otherwise. So um, Ms. Harris, thank you very much for joining us. And um, we're gonna move on to Lori Belden and then Lisa Harvey McPherson. So Lori Belden, hang on tight. I'm gonna move you over to become a panelist. And then we'll go to Lisa Harvey McPherson. Good afternoon. There she oh is. Hi. Yes. Sorry, the, the, the pause yes. threw me off a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, yeah. Senator Claxton and, and Senator Breen, Senator Purse and Representative Meyer. Um, my name is Lori Belden, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Home Care and Hospice Alliance of Maine. We're a membership organization representing home care, home health care, and hospice providers across the state. I really do appreciate this opportunity to respond to the budget proposal. Um, In-home care ranges from short-term physician-directed care, which allows your loved ones to recover from an illness or injury at home rather than a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, as well as to longer-term services with skilled nursing, and ventilator care to personal care, such as bathing, dressing, and housekeeping. For many years, reimbursement rates have failed to cover the cost of providing care, and our providers have struggled not only to deliver uninterrupted quality care in the home, but also to simply keep their doors open, as we saw last year with the closing of Home Care for Maine. We did see some relief last year with direct care worker rates increasing for several main care sections, but there are, there are outstanding issues that remain and need to be addressed in order in order for providers to continue to provide statewide home care services. The increase passed last year's, in last year's supplemental budget and put into place by the administration on April 1st, 2020, covered several types of direct care workers, including personal support specialists, home health aides, um, and certified nursing assistants. But it is important to note that RN and LPN rates were not uh, increased as we had anticipated. And um, I do appreciate the thorough review we just had about the budget and those legislators who asked for clarification um, because it became very obvious that I have to add <laughs> cost of living to my to-do list to advocate because our, our providers don't see those um, increases on a regular basis, either with rebasing or cost of living, which again, um, puts us at a great disadvantage. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated long-standing rate challenges um, and workforce shortages in home care and hospice sector. In response to the pandemic, um, our home care and hospice services, I believe, have been exceptional, and the care our members have provided has kept countless people out of acute care hospitals and nursing facilities. In fact, throughout the pandemic, our home health care nurses and staff have cared for thousands of individuals with COVID at home, far more than the number of COVID patients that have been hospitalized. In fact, just last week, our home care um, providers self-reported that they are caring for over 200 people in safely in the home. Um, about 100, a little over 150 are COVID positive um, and about 50 or so are uh, presumed uh, are under investigation for um, uh, being um, with COVID. So we are doing, um, I think, a, a great job keeping people safe in their home um, while still receiving um, complex care. 
we are aware of the department's ongoing comprehensive rate evaluation, and we were we were um, we did participate in the stakeholder engagement portion of the evaluation process. We are heartened by the department's uh, wants to tackle the issue by finding long-term solutions, um, but our uh, and our and our provider needs additional our providers need additional support now. There are going to be many patients that go without needed care, as Jess Maurer has um, spoken earlier about, and many provider agencies will struggle to keep their doors open if we have to wait another one or two years to um, adjust these rates. As you consider the biannual budget proposal, we want to call your attention to the need to increase RN and LPN rates for main care section 19, main care section 96, and chapter 5, the ODES policy manual section 63. During the 127th legislature, Representative Ellie Esfling was a champion of ours and worked on issues to increase home care rates. The original intent of her legislation was to increase nursing rates along with other direct care workers. However, the RN LPA increases were never, were never implemented by the Department of Health and Human Services. The RN and LPN rates, reimbursement rates have therefore fallen well behind where they should be to retain needed staff, staffing levels, um, during a time of acute nursing workforce shortage. We are pleased to see that Main Care Interim Rate Study Report recommends that rates align with Main Care rates when applicable. This is our request for Section 40 Home Care Program. Main Care has a per visit rate that applies to all home care services provided in the Main Care Section 40 Program, the nursing, therapy, social work, and home care aides. We look forward to working with all of you on this specific rate request, as well as the issue of RN and LPN rate increase. We'd like to thank the members of this committee and the Health and Human Services Committee for your work you have done in recent years to address the inadequate rates across main care services. We understand the challenges you face in determining the best way to address the, the crisis level issues while also striving to find longer term issues, long term solutions to ensure adequate care across the spectrum of services. Thank you as you consider care provided by home care, home health care, and hospice providers as you tackle these challenging issues. Thank you, Ms. Belden. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Belden from any of the committee members? I am not seeing any. So um, thank you. Thanks really so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Lisa Harvey McPherson and then Wanda Pelkey. So um, hang on one moment and we will have uh, Lisa Harvey McPherson join us. And there she is, welcome. There, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Senator Green and Senator Claxton, Representative Purse and Representative Meyer. My name is Lisa Harvey McPherson and I'm here today to speak in opportunity position to specific budget items on behalf of Northern Light Health. I won't repeat of what my great and esteemed colleagues, Jeff Austin and Katie Fulham Harris have testified to, but I will supplement the comments that they've shared with additional information. First, I want to um, remind everyone of my supplemental budget uh, testimony regarding um, both the, the honor that we have to care for Maine's population in our hospitals, our home care programs, our hospice and our nursing homes as we work together uh, to care for Maine citizens during the COVID pandemic. And we are undertaking the largest public health initiative ever stood up by Northern Light Health establishing COVID-19 vaccine clinics from Portland, Maine to Presque Isle. And we are very proud of that work. But COVID has had a financial impact. And as I shared with you last month, for fiscal year 20 that ended this fall, despite receiving $88 million in CARES public health um, funding for hospitals, we ended our fiscal year with an $82.6 million loss. And the financial impact continues to this very day. I'm going to begin uh, with a comment on the hospital tax. It's important to understand that the tax impact and the match impact is different for every hospital. The tax may be higher at one hospital and lower at another, and the match may fully offset the tax at one hospital, but leave another hospital with a net loss when they pay the tax and have the offsetting match. 
For Northern Light Health, when we add up all the pluses and minuses of the budget proposal, we will experience a tax increase, not offset by the match, of $643,000. And so I echo the uh, previous testimony. If you are going to increase that tax, and we understand that that's an important revenue source, fully offset that match for us. We want to, I want to thank your, uh, the Health and Human Services Committee for their thoughtful discussion regarding the 340B cut in the supplemental budget and the unanimous recommendation to move that cut out of the supplemental budget. It's important to understand while the discount comes from the pharmaceutical manufacturers, not every hospital is eligible. You need to be a hospital serving a vulnerable population. That's a critical access hospital. It's a rural hospital. It's a larger hospital that has a high disproportionate share of Medicaid patients and Medicare SSI disability patients. For Northern Light Health, the 340B cut is just under $2 million. It's a significant cut for us. And we do uh, respectfully disagree with Ben that there is a federal mandate that the state must implement this payment reduction. Uh, Northern Light Health uh, met with national uh, representatives from the Alliance for 340B, and they provided us with documentation from the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services specific to the states on this very issue of do states need to pay at the acquisition costs for drugs purchased in the 340B program and administered by hospital-based providers in the outpatient setting? And the answer is no. And so I put specific reference to this document in my testimony. It's a public document. Um, it's available online and I'm glad to provide that document at the work session. I also want to thank the committee uh, for uh, moving out of the supplemental budget recommendations uh, cut to nursing facility bed hold days. On any given day, we have patients living in the hospital for extended periods for a variety of reasons. But we are particularly challenged before the pandemic and today with finding enough nursing home beds for certain patients with certain special needs. The nursing facility becomes the individual's facility-based home and to penalize them with loss of their home and force them to live in an environment that is not only inappropriate to meet their needs once they're clinically eligible for discharge, but COVID today presents a distinct challenge for having anyone in a hospital bed that shouldn't be there. And I also wanna speak with concern on behalf of rural pharmacies. Northern Light does have a pharmacy and the cut in the budget uh, doesn't impact us to the extent that it will impact rural pharmacies. But it wasn't that long ago that rural pharmacies were closing. And this budget eliminates the pharmacy incentive payment program and decreases the main care drug dispensing fee that will disproportionately impact rural pharmacies that have a higher volume of main care patients because they don't have the commercial insurance patients to offset the impact of that cut. I have, Northern Light has concern about access to pharmaceuticals in rural communities. We wanna make sure that when our patients return home that they have access to the medications that they need in their local communities. And we are concerned about the impact of that cut. I do want to share with you tomorrow, you'll hear from Acadia Hospital. Acadia Hospital is disproportionately impacted by a cut of $1.9 million on their outpatient behavioral health services. And you'll hear from Dr. Campbell, our chief medical officer about that tomorrow. But I mentioned that today because for Northern Light Health as a system, in this budget document, we are looking at a total cut of $4.4 million at a time where we have historic losses unlike anything that we have ever experienced. And with that, I welcome any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. McPherson, really appreciate it. Um, are there any questions um, from the committee members for Ms. McPherson? Not seeing any. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, the last person I have today is um, Wanda Pelkey. And um, I have two different, two different slots on my attendee list. So I'm gonna 
hopefully get this right. Just bear with us. I might have to uh, try a couple times to get her over to be um, a panelist. So um, hopefully she will be joining us. Hello. Oh, there she is. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, before we do begin, and I hope you can see me okay here. Um, yeah. I, my name is Nadine Grosso, and I am with the healthcare, uh, Maine Healthcare Association. And probably a, a reason for the confusion um, is that I have been asked to read in the testimony today of Wanda Pelkey. And so I guess I would ask permission because I'm sure that the email address and the name don't, don't match. Uh, so if it pleases uh, both committees, would that be okay? Uh, sure. And just... Um, Ms. Pelkey is with, um, say that again. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and read her testimony Great. so it's clear. Okay, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committees. My name is Wanda Pelkey, and I'm the board chair for the Maine Healthcare Association, and I'm also the chief financial officer for First Atlantic Healthcare, a Maine-based company caring for approximately 1,500 residents in 20 nursing homes and residential care facilities throughout Maine. Um, like, like so many others today, uh, I, I think at this point, we generally have mixed feelings now about the budget. Uh, there are certainly things that we are very appreciative of, um, including the nursing facility um, cost of living adjustments, as well as the rebasing, all of which is required by statute. Uh, I think we heard from Mr. Mann uh, that the COLAs for the PNMIs are also included. And if that's the case, we're certainly grateful for that. Uh, one point I do want to make is that we ask that you ensure that the budget continues the supplemental wage allowance. Um, this was an allowance that was provided specifically across for nursing facilities and residential care facilities last year, and it was uh, enacted to cover minimum wage rates uh, that were also enacted uh, a year ago. Stripping out the SWA now uh, would certainly be unaffordable for our homes. Direct care staff shortages are pressuring labor rates more than I've ever seen in my 30 years of this work. Um, I also disagree with eliminating the funding for bed hold payments for the same reasons provided uh, during supplemental budget testimony, as well as the, the reasons that you've heard here today. Uh, and also just wanna take this opportunity to thank members of the Health and Human Services Committee for their unanimous opposition to this cut. Uh, this funding payment is very important for all, all of the reasons that you've heard today. Beyond this feedback, I would like to see the establishment of a temporary relief funding program to support our homes through the COVID-19 pandemic. And here is why I believe it's necessary. For nursing facilities, direct relief from the CARES Act program is mostly exhausted. In our 20 homes, two thirds have fully used the monies for their intended purpose. And for the moment, more federal funding is uncertain. PPP loans were unavailable to our company because as a group, we exceeded the maximum 250 employee test. Many of our peers also didn't qualify. COVID -relating, related staffing costs are exorbitant. You've heard a lot about the staffing challenges today. Many more hours are necessary uh, to combat COVID-19 and follow regulatory guidance. Worker scarcity, incentive pay, greater use of agency workers, all contributes to increased staffing costs. Many workers have simply left their jobs fearing the risk of exposure to them and their families. And maybe these factors will subside months from now, but today the need is real. And the costs of PPE, COVID testing ongoing, and sanitation supplies are also excessive. And last but not least, lost revenues are a huge problem. As you've also heard from others today, our occupancy rates are currently at an all-time low, averaging about 70%. This is 20% less than normal due to a variety of factors. Limited admissions during outbreaks, uh, quarantining suspected cases, staffing shortages, one of, the, one of the key ones, and of course, customer fears. I mean, we're not, we're not seeing a lot of community referrals, uh, want, you know, folks wanting to come into our facilities and simply put, COVID has greatly disrupted normal, the normal admission process. To fund such a temporary relief program, uh, I ask whether monies are available from the following sources. We have unused temporary rate increases that are currently being recouped by DHHS, continuation of the CARES Act enhanced FMAP rates through 2021, 
and the estimated 25 million unspent from the Maine Healthcare Provider Relief Grant Program. This was a grant program that was made available to nursing facilities and hospitals uh, in December of last year with a very tight turnaround time, a fairly complicated application process. And we understand um, of the 30 million or so that was offered, uh, we believe only around 5 million uh, were actually, $5 million in grant funds were actually um, awarded. So in closing, I would support the same terms and conditions used by the Federal CARES Act program for eligible COVID related costs and lost revenues in any kind of similar state program. I'm also open to further discussion, you know, if there's another reimbursement mechanism that's more appropriate uh, to carry out the intent of such a relief program, uh, certainly open to talking about that. I just would ask that we would do that sooner rather than later. Um, and I think the final thing I just wanna add is that on behalf of the First Atlantic facilities, I mean, all of the staff, the residents and the families, thank you for sticking with us during this really difficult time. Um, this is uh, certainly un unlike anything we've ever seen and it's been a really hard year. So we're, we're really appreciative of, of the folks that we have uh, affiliated with our company and our organizations. Thank you. Apologize that uh, Wanda couldn't be here today and she thanks you for your time and service. Thank you. Yes. Um, any questions? Um, uh, Representative Hymanson, go ahead. Um, this is for the work session. I wonder if we could have um, some information about the provider relief program. Sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe from our staff too would be great. <clears throat> you can get that from um, the administration. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Purse. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually don't have a question, but I believe Rick Erb thought he was in our attendee list under Wanda as well. And so we're trying to fix that. Or okay. are you aware of that? Yes. Oh, you're on, you're on Can mute. You hear me now? Nope. Uh, There's some people who are pretending to be Wanda Pelkey. Too. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and we even work together. So that that's so scary. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Mr. Erb. Okay. Uh, would you like me to proceed now? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, Senator Claxton, Representative Meyer, and members of the committee. My name is Rick Erb. I'm the president and CEO of the Maine Healthcare Association. I'm not Wanda. I'm not chair of the board. Anyway, uh, we certainly appreciate the difficulty of uh, assembling a budget in such a difficult year, uh, but cannot support LD-221 as we do not feel that it meets the needs of long-term care facilities. At the outset, I want to reiterate our objection to the discontinuation of bed hole payments to nursing homes. Uh, we had addressed this issue in the supplemental budget as well. We appreciated the uh, uh, recommendation that came from the HHS committee to uh, eliminate that cut I also appreciate the comments today from Katie Fulham Harris and Lisa Harvey McPherson and their support for bed hole payments. State statutes require an annual cost of living adjustment for nursing homes and Appendix C PNMIs, as well as a rebasing of nursing home expenses every other year. Uh, we had had some difficulty in trying to confirm if those requirements were fully funded. Uh, some of Ben Mann's testimony today uh, I think did address that. I would ask if there are any questions left on whether uh, those increases are funded that they be addressed at work session. A year ago, none of us expected that a newly reported virus would have such a profound effect on our long-term care facilities, their staff and their residents. While early concerns centered on a potential surge in hospital admissions, it soon became clear that the underlying healthcare needs of elderly residents living in congregate settings would trigger a looming crisis. Maine's long-term care facilities have performed admirably under difficult circumstances, but this has come at a cost. Last April, MHCA approached the Department of Health and Human Services with our best estimate of the cost to protect our residents and staff going forward. DHHS promptly approved temporary rate increases for facilities with the understanding that the rates would be reviewed and possibly adjusted in June. We were surprised and disappointed to see that the rates were eliminated in June. 
with the exception of payments to facilities in the midst of an actual outbreak. The main care rates would no longer reflect the ongoing cost to keep the virus out of our buildings. What we didn't know at that time was that the worst was yet to come. Although the rest, along with the rest of Maine, we saw the number of COVID cases surge in the latter half of 2020, where 16 facilities saw an outbreak of three or more cases from April through June, 100 saw an outbreak from July through January. During this period, Maine providers saw a dramatic increase in the cost of labor as workers became harder to find and agency rates became subject to bidding wars. PPE use skyrocketed and prices rose due to boosted demand. Staff and resident testing increased, partially paid for by the state, but not entirely. At the same time, facility revenues dropped as occupancy rates fell by an average of 15%. Earlier in the pandemic, some federal funds were direct, went directly to these facilities, and this became critical to their financial survival. But the frequency and amounts of these payments have dwindled at the very time that Maine was dealing with the surge. Our long-term care providers need your help now. Maine's temporary increases were allowed to lapse, even though demands on our facilities and staff were accelerating. I would ask the committee to respond to our needs by reinstating a rate increase to offset increased costs and lost revenue. Many other states have provided support in the 10% range to rates. In Maine's case, we operate on a cost settle basis, meaning that any unused COVID funds would likely be recovered by the state. This initiative could be funded with uh, in several ways. One, the enhanced FMAP rate Maine is receiving that was discussed earlier. Two, recirculated temp temporary rate increase funds that were recovered from providers in 2020. Or three, almost $25 million in funding that appears to have gone unspent from the Maine Health Care Provider Relief Grant Program. This last source comes from a program that was hastily administered in December. At the time, we were all under the impression that the federal government would require all funds to be spent by December 31st, 2020. It is my understanding that this deadline has now been extended. The fragile state of long-term care became fully evident during the pandemic. Despite hopeful signs from vaccination, we are not through this yet. I want to especially recognize the people who work in the facilities. This effort has been has come at a personal cost to them and they deserve our gratitude. The state needs to be certain that current obligations are maintained and that federal relief funds find their way to those on the front lines of the pandemic. Thank you for your time today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Erb. Um, I have a quick question about the temporary rate increase and um, what you heard from the department about um, whether it could be reinstated. I mean, a, as you know, we were not in session, you know, from March until January. Um, so um, there are a number of service providers around the state that experienced that temporary rate increase for any number of um, folks they serve. And um, I wonder what you heard back about why it was for, why it ended when it ended and it wasn't um, ramped up again as COVID cases were ramped up again. Can you share that with us if you feel uh, comfortable? I, I can try. I mean, I, I really think the department will have to speak for themselves on this. Um, we did our best to estimate what costs would be, came in with a proposal, um, I believe that it was used in some ways as a model for other types of providers. To my knowledge, they were all discontinued in June. So we were not singled out in that respect. Um, at the time, my understanding was that it was a, a budget decision. Um, it, was, it was a resource decision. That was the answer that I got, but they really would have to speak for themselves further. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Any other questions for Mr. Erb? Okay. Um, then I think that that um, concludes the public testimony. Um, Representative Purse, would you mind um, having uh, helping me move Mr. Erb back over to um, the attendee panel? I believe it just happened. Okay, thank you. I, yeah, I was worried if I moved one Wanda, all the Wandas would leave. I understand. <laughs> I, pre I appreciate your attention to detail. Um, so we have uh, finished with the public hearing and the public testimony. Um, we are still live and on YouTube. And so I just wanted to check in with um, committee members. We have our analysts here to see if there are any questions or um, need any clarifications about um, what we will be doing tomorrow. We, we're gonna move what was supposed to be happening yesterday to tomorrow morning. And then, um, so we'll have more HHS related testimony tomorrow. And just grabbing my schedule. Um, So tomorrow we're going to hear about um, what was scheduled for yesterday, which is um, department administration, social services, and public health and public assistance in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we will be hearing about children's services, developmental disabilities, substance use disorder, adult mental health, and brain injury programs. Um, so with that in mind, are there any questions? Anyone need anything for tomorrow? I'm not seeing any. So um, if there is any, feel free to shoot, give me a call or uh, shoot me an email. Um, otherwise, um, uh, I would like um, Representative Millett and um, Senator Davis to stay on just for a second. And then I will say to uh, other folks, thank you for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. This meeting is adjourned. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.